America, because you've never seen America before. When you see, when you see skyscrapers on the TV, it was like that, Mike. You know, wow, and then you, American football, American football team, basketball is another guy. I love basketball. Do you remember the Globe, Globe Trotters? Harlem Globe Trotters, that was a, the man, man. Man. It's not a new thing. They've been doing that forever. I mean, they used to wear makeup in the Tudor times. <laughs> when my uncles and my family were having their little gets togethers, your men always sit down at some point around the table and get the old rum out and just get the dominoes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you see them start slapping the table like they're trying <laughs> to kung fu chop the table in half. Dominoes is like, that's like a man's game. And look, and I was intrigued by what I was looking at. The thing about the camera was, I could, it was like little worlds in there. It was like the coal mines. Wow. You know, when you see Don McCain's black and whites, bruv. Whoa. Amazing. Pow, hard blacks, hard whites, Bill Brahm was like, yeah, that's what I'm oh, saying. Oh, bombs Mate, bombs for all I know, we was jumping around on bombs, unexploded bombs. Yeah. I remember that old iron, brown iron stuff and then like, those big round ones that they used yeah. to drop on the sea and stuff. I remember seeing one like, for real life and we used to like throw stones at it, you bing, bing. Um, you know, techniques together so when you could, you learn how to dodge. <laughs> <laughs> and then, you know, you, you know. <laughs> now it's just a little shouting in the ears and then shouting in the ears yeah. never got used to get one round the back of the yeah. ear. And these sort of songs are, for me, Planet Rock. Oh, come on. Oh, oh, these man is that the first time you got Jamia come on put the plate on the thing, yeah. And as I say, I'm on them up there, come follow me in our areas. Them kind of things there, yeah. That's the real origination of man expressing what's going on around him in his world. I never forget when I did Derek B's record sleeve. Mm. Good groove. I never forget seeing that Pete picture. Friesen, first time I saw the fish islands, that guy used to be in the, in the skate parks. He, he, he got a whole skate park. When he sees the guy coming out or doing a pop out or whatever, it's all, and you're like, whoa, and then next thing I know, public yeah. enemy sleeve. You know what I mean? MC Duke breaking the mold, wearing the Dax on his album cover. You know what I mean? Even even um, Demon Boys, when we said to them, you know, you, you know, you can get a prop for the shoot. What do you want to get? I'm giving away all my techniques and secrets here. Yeah? Sleeve, what's what going on? Yeah. It's like it gets all distorted and round. And you put your hand in the hand, all big and I'm all small. And I've done a couple of moves like that. Dre had a look and he goes, oh, yeah, that's all right. Like, and so all that I got was Ren going like that. Talking I don't mind all that. The professional graffiti eyes, but trust me, I do love a bomber who's breaking all the rules, 10 foot or whatever, he's gone upside he's down on the place. And all them gone like, yeah. crazy, you, you I love that. So they just, touch to my friend, second or two. I second or two, I'm gonna become that man back too. <laughs> How you feeling, love it? Street style, what I was doing was make a high class, top end, coffee table book, paying the highest respect on a, a print and publishing level to my culture. Yeah. I loved oh. it, I loved it. I mean, to be honest, this is burned out three of my batteries. Oi, bruv. Three of my batteries. I gotta got open a window, man. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is the one that Look you use. Look at the size of it. Look, do you want to hear something? Yes. Whoa! <laughs> Heavyweight! Yeah. And now I'm with a lightweight business. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Camera action. <laughs> On this week's show, we have someone who was documenting history through the lens of a camera back in the day. He was also the presenter on the BBC TV show called Dance Energy, who is an absolute powerhouse of energy himself. <laughs> I'm excited to say we have the one and only Diamond Geezer, the big cat himself. We've got Lonsky in the back. Ooh. Yes, my... Bless up, Stevie, How mate. How you doing, man? I'm good, man. Thank you for having me in the old... Old cab. Listen, what do you Very mean? We were meant to do this years ago. Right. Yeah, I'm, I, I never had any grain up here. <laughs> you know what? It's yeah. funny, like, because I've years probably ago. I changed mine off now, but you know, it does feel like a decade ago. It was, and I can't believe now, because basically I spoke to Prick Kelsey, and Prick was like, yeah. a good friend of mine, Prick, big up Prick. And he was like, you know, Normski's released his book. I was like, you're joking. I yeah. spoke to Norm about, must have been about six years ago. Yeah, I was yeah, in Hoburn, and I was like, Norm, what are you up to? You go, oh, I'm sorting this book out. And now yeah. you finally released it. Got it done. Ma Man with the golden shutter. Man with the golden shutter. <clears throat> and we can't wait to chat about that later in All the right, uh, interview because I know it is a flame grilled, sure shot banger of a book. <laughs> 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 
I, I don't know, you should be writing my PR, bro. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Frame grilled. Listen, we're going to take, take it to the ruckus. Come on. Listen, we're going in, we're going in. But listen, Normski, an honour for you to be stepping forward to do this interview. Nah, it's a pleasure, mate. And I know a lot of people want to hear, you know, uh, obviously your history and that. So let's let's kick it off with the first question. Go on. Uh, whereabouts are you from and what was it like growing up, you know, as a youngster? Uh, yeah, well, I'm originally North West London boy, to be honest. Uh, yeah, like I kind of... Wilsdon, area. Well, interestingly enough, um, yes, in a way, but... Uh, yeah, West London, i.e. as in Alperton, which is pretty get damn close to Wilsdon. Yeah. That's where I started. What? Then we moved to Kilburn. Mm. So Wilson's in between both of those. So yeah, NW, North West, North Weezy. North and West, then we Weezy. moved to um, Camden, Chalk Farm. Oh, right. And that's really where I kind of, uh, you know, I mean, I say then, 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 then. I moved to Chalk Farm, uh, Primrose Hill, when I was nine, about 10 years old. So I've already, you know, done 10 years before I've kicked into getting involved in creativity and stuff and all that. But it really really all hails from really from Brazil them days like no, you know no tell me tell me what London was like back in what was you growing up in the 70s I, era? I was born in 1966 you're proper old school aren't I you? am yeah I'm you're, very, I'm, you're only a few years older than me though oh thanks for that I'm glad to but know looking, I'm a little you're bit look, old you're looking, you? you're looking 20 years younger well I made the effort with the old razor blade <laughs> and the baseball cap. You're having a bad hair day today, and that's all right. When you get to my age, you can have any day. You don't have to worry about it. No matter it. what day it is. Don't matter about the looks. It's all about the vibe. But um. Hundred percent. Yeah, what was, it, what was your question? Yeah, so what was it like growing up in the summer? Oh yeah, I mean, like, you mate. Know, like London, it was... Yeah, no, it was like, it, it still looked like it was a bomb site, basically. Exactly. It was, it was a lot of wasteland, didn't it? Everything was wasteland. 70s was terrible in, in this country, I think. You and know. it was very divided. It was a divided era. It was divided, but it was also... Um, it was possibly when it was actually, believe it or not, coming together. I would have said the 60s was really much more divided because, yeah. you know, having black people, Caribbean people was a new thing to this country. And, and you know, in, well, in the droves, I mean, and we were, the, I'm first generation born here, if you like, uh, um, which, you know, us, us kids. So it was an interesting thing where it was a new time. Um, but what, you know, where I was growing up in was old fashioned London, which there's a few bits of it, you know, are currently surrounded by a bit of it. You know, you can still see pockets of it, but all these years later, there's so much modern you know modernism if you like and new structures i mean but, back back in the day i mean for me it was like it was very grimy but was, but it was gritty but grim. it was also full of it was quite grim but it, was, it was full of action and it was you know to be fair but it was still full of soul as well that, right? loads it's, you can say you had all of the kind of you know you had the sort of soul scene anyway like you know northern soul edge yeah. yeah. but i used to remember seeing a lot of people when i was young say like even between the age of say 10 to 15 up to maybe even 18 i'm going into the early 80s there right there there was still a lot of teddy boys rock and roll yeah, girls yeah, it was a very yeah, common yeah, sight everyone i thought i was in the 50s often you had the teddy boys yeah the, coming to the, the, the end the of the, end of the and all the haircuts and you had, you know you had the mods and loads the mods. of mods so that's a trans that sort of trans yeah. Is translate from the sixties and mods, the mods style are, and the an mods attitude. Are wicked. The mods are wicked, like yeah, the way because, they dressed and the music. Well, they had good taste in music and they look yeah. sharp. And again, that was very. I'm Jamaican heritage, my family. So you know, my family are very proud Caribbean people, and it would be very normal for them to have a, a good suit on, a sharp 100%. suit, to, tonic, any you know, patent shoes. Very normal to look really crisp would be 100%. the way. But but yeah. reminds me of that very moddy time as well. Um, and that's really what I've grown up with, you know, with um, sort, of, sort, of, sort of sense of place in that sense of pride and actually part of, a, like you say, a growing new city, a new city. Exactly. So, we, 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 were, we were seeing it from, obviously, from the very, very start when it was very grimy and gritty and wasteland mm. and industrial. So like all that kind of all them wasteland sites getting developed and becoming, you know, this kind yeah. of city, which has become, you know, obviously it is. It's layers, you know that, don't you, about the city? It must be late. I'm true Londoner, bro. I'm born in the city, I've been here. I've never lived anywhere else for any longer than three months. Wow. That's 57 years I've been in the city. You've and let me tell you something about this place, man. The layers. When I say to people the layers, they, the levels. Yeah, they go, what do you mean? I go, so if you think about it, it's on top and you just, you can, you can, if you dig down this tarmac rows deep enough, you'll see the cobbles. 100%. Yeah, the cobbles are still there because yeah. that you, in some places they try to take the cobbles up. I don't know how the hell they put cobbles on the on the on the road, but yeah. some of these cobbles are still there. They're, still they're Victorian. Yeah. yeah they're yeah. still on ground. You're still walking on Victorian ground. Yeah, yeah. So don't get your modern head all twisted. 
Your roots are connected to what? So it's either plastic, which we put there that melts tarmac, or it's bricks and mortar, is a good way of putting it, bricks yeah. and mortar. Yeah. And uh, I was thinking about that the other day when I saw a house, like, uh, with this little building around, around the corner, some blokes, you know, really done it, real pointed the buildings. Put, and I looked at those bricks and I thought, that's, that's the same bricks. So they've taken the old bricks off, but they put new ones in, but then it's the same architecture. It's, it's the same spot. old mm. terrace building. It looks exactly the same yeah, yeah, as yeah. it did, what, when 1930 when it was first built? And also, you know? and also London is very kind of like little villages. Little yeah, that, yeah, it is loads of little villages and, and, and you know, and there's a lot of history in that village thing where you know you have the big house yeah. which is the person who's got power in the village or and uh, then you've got the worker houses which are the smaller houses and then you've got the basement which is generally where you know in those I'm going back to those times where the, you know the workers would live in the basement and or they'd have the outhouses they call it and there's a lot of people that live in an outhouse and they love it because it's got character and stuff and back, also back in the day Norm your toilet your toilet was, oh, it's your that, it was outside in the garden, yeah. Outside. Yeah, that was out in the garden, yeah. Um, you didn't really have like, like hot running water back then. Like, yeah, like, no, you know, well, like, actually. One bath, one bath a month. You know what, it's funny that. Bath. Wow, you know what, you just remind me, I forgot about that. You're absolutely right. Oh my God, we used to have to boil water mm. in on the, on the stove mm. to boil hot water. And I'm just thinking, oh, obviously it's boil kettle. But now I think about it, we used to boil water. Mum used to put it and bathe me. So maybe we didn't even have hot running water when I was really little. When I was in my little, when I was, uh, maybe we didn't even have run, hot running water. You wouldn't. Um, you would have boiled it, boiled it on the on the gas, probably gas. Jesus, I mean, maybe. Wow, I didn't realise I was that old. But <laughs> then again, I'm not that old. That just goes to show you're young. You're we're young not young. as you know as fast uh, uh, you know in the future as we think, because we still have those old fashioned traditions. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. You know, although that someone's invented an air fryer. I'm still trying to work that out. <laughs> I know, I know. Our but, but, times, our times have changed. But no, would you go in like? Would you go into like the blues parties as well? No, I was too young. Too young, too young for that. Yeah, all them blues parties. That would have been my older cousins. Right. Yeah, my older cousins that I used to look up to. I was born at a funny time, 60, 66, in the sense of where things were happening and developing. Because my older cousins, they would have been like sixty. Some of them were sixty one, sixty two. 63 so by the time i was 10 them, them would have been the teenagers they would have been there you know they're the ones that had the wicked dancers that used to go with first early club dancers you know i was aspiring to them but they were my generation my generation we weren't that cool yet so that's i think where the advancement of what we, what our interest was and it was a combination of popular music of the time um and yeah obviously being a jamaican heritage family um reggae was always in my mind music was that staple it's always been part of it, always. And how, how about, you know, how about things like, I know uh, Elvis obviously was big back in the well, day. Well, like, yeah, you were interviewing my parents, they would say, oh yeah, we loved Elvis when we were younger, because that was the mu that was the popular music of the time. Yeah. You know what I mean? And I think you'll find that even today, today a lot of people are into trap and grime, because that's this is their music. So what we had was we had a real combination of funk, reggae, jazz it was really rhythm and blues it's really positive quality uplifting. quality music positive, yeah rock music if you're talking about rock artists you know i'm not far off of the the back end of what the beatles were doing or rolling stones these guys were you know rolling stones a better example you know um of music that you were looking back on to thinking wow you know and that was a really big deal and then at the same time you know i'm talking about the early 80s late 70s you had punk Mm. You know, these now that started to represent my generation, even though I was never a punk. So we was more into Rude Boy because we had the madness, the specials, yeah. and the selector. Yeah, so yeah. you know, and that's where you find in your place. And and uh, and even madness, selector, and specials is a perfect example of the continuation of, of uh, Afro Caribbean uh, and multicultural coming to the UK for the first time. You before is a perfect example. Half Rasta, half white, love reggae music. You know, madness got a reggae slant to it. Even the police. You know, had a little reggae slant to it because at the time reggae was a warm and a really good voice. You know, Bob Marley was massive. It was a wicked vibe, wasn't it? Yeah, wicked and vibe. you're right. Out of the back end of it, you would have had these blues parties and stuff. But I knew about blues parties, but I went to a few dances like that but with my mates. We used to love going to a few reggae parties, but at the same time, I always felt a little bit like I felt maybe like it was too much like being at one of my mum's things, and like it weren't really my sound as much as what is the more modern stuff so mm -hmm. and that's where really where the hip-hop when hip-hop started that man bam bam that was us because don't forget when hip-hop really first started as well it was american was the first route and by that time in the uk 
television, the best television was anything that was from America, because you've never seen America before. When you see, when you see skyscrapers on the TV, uh, it was like that, Mike. You know, wow, and then you, American football, American football team, basketball was another guy, I love basketball. Do you remember the Globe Globetrotters? Harlem Globetrotters, Globe 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 that was up. The I man! See them. I see them in the 70s at Wembley. There you go, there you go, you know, and that was really weird as well, because they kind of opened the, the sport up to a world through entertainment and fun yeah. and music. Yeah. You know, and it's a basketball game, you know, there's a kind of exhibition basketball players, which interestingly enough, if you look at the actual players that went throughout, that were some of the best basketball players of the time. Those those uh, those years of like early eighties were pivotal. I mean, it was an amazing scene. As you said, you had the punk scene, uh, yeah. which was a very political uh, scene as absolutely, well. Absolutely, absolutely. You, you you then had like obviously you had the new romantic scene as well. Uh, no, which was you didn't even amazing. get to the new romantic. That's epic because that was truly a a follow-on, if you like, of the sort of uh, the fashionable end. Hundred percent. Uh, do you remember, do you remember the velvet? All the, the velvet they used to wear with big frilly shirts. Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the yeah, with like, that would be Adam and Adam and them kind of people. And the makeup and all that, like the yeah. Shirts, I mean, they're the going secret. on about the main way of makeup now, nah, bruv, It's not a new thing. They've been doing that forever. I mean, they used to wear makeup in the Tudor times. Man's is wearing stockings. But and 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 also the way things were developing. I mean, I I just I see you another thing as well. I'd love to touch on as well. When we were going like early eighties, yeah. I'd love to touch on Babylon. The, the, the film, well, the film Babylon. that's another element you see, but you see that, you know... How important was because that? Because that was representative, truly, of what it was like being black Because it was Britain. filmed, it was filmed in that, in that era. It yeah, well, like everything it, that comes out of that era is in that era, so, era, era, so in actual fact, it, it is just like, you know, it's a documentary film about what life was like about mm. you and uh, Babylon and, you know, and those sort of movies like that would show that what it was like for a... Uh, for the black community in a, in a community that was a little bit not sure about who these people were and what they're about and the vibrancy and the color and the music was a probably a bit of like whoa i mean not being funny united kingdom but you didn't even know what bass was apart from the old cow drums and the double stand-up bass obviously but i'm talking about amplified bass when the sound systems that's the mm. 70s, 60s, 70s, you start getting speakers getting made. Mm. And that film was getting, you know, oh Brinsley Ford and them not running in the yeah. school, Jug Drang and Tannoy's out of school, you know, and, uh, and, and Jar, making, Jar, making speakers Shaka, at home. Shaka. Shaka. RRP Jar Shaka. Uh, yeah, bless him up. I got a shot of him actually in my book. I, you know, I was lucky enough to see him. You know, I did go Have you got a Jar Shaka photo in your book? Yeah. Wow, wow. <laughs> oh, we're going to get onto that later. Ah, uh, you never know what names will pop out. You never no, know. No. I do enjoy having a chat with you actually, because it's quite nice to speak with somebody who um, is from that era as well because a lot of people wouldn't quite understand it you know you, you don't want to sort of have to you know dissect a human being but I can pretty much look at people and say wow you can see the where the inspirations have come from 100%. Uh, and and it's really important to to look further in the mirror for people as well to sort of see where you get your ideas from because it's interesting you know it's really interesting you know um, even the idea still to this, this, this day the mod Parker Mm. What was the actual use for the Mod Parker? Was yeah. it? An, it's an army surplus thing. Yeah, but it become a fashion. Yeah, surplus. but yeah, but what part of the army are they wearing this Parker? Like, and you had the target on the back. The, yeah, well, and again, the target. they're coming out of the war. You and see, the that's remember post, the foxes, the foxes tail. That's post. Well. That's what. That's post war kids right there. But and then you've got people only in the nineteen forties, right, it which little, is less Sunday than a hundred years ago, mm. right around there. They were. It was the Blitz, bruv, yeah. getting bombed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, a lot of people don't know about that. A lot of people can't say certain things. They don't know half their family were in the, the wars that, you know, and so was, they also had a, a, a time where they would have been just under it, you know, desperately. Um, that and must have been you, a horrific time to live. Oh, uh, Can well, you imagine? Yeah, but I don't know, you know, you can pick that in any time to live. You can have any, there's a war right now somewhere in the world. This is yeah, a mad thing, yeah, but, yeah. you know, Touch when, your city's, when your city's just been heavily bombed, and yeah. it's like, there's not much left. Well, you just show the effect of it. They're still fixing from the effects of that in 2023. They're mm. still, you can still see, the, you know, um, and, and that's a mad thing as well. But, you know, with regards to style and attitude, um, all these horrible things, actually, they kind of are f the food for thought, you know, out of the sadness, we have to have fun. So people would be a bit more singing soggy. I mean, we say it must have been terrible, but actually, they're all in there 
hope with hope and glory and singing in the pubs and da da da. You know, here and you know, hoping that they don't get bombed. Not sitting there waiting. Like I find some people like you know, while you're alive, do something. You know, be a bit alive rather than sitting there. And I think back in those days, people life was so precious and could have stopped any moment that people just lived to the max. I reckon. Yeah, so do, you know what, there. You know, do you know what Norm thinking about you you're 100% right I mean you know you, you'd see pick old photographs of like you know w women in a pub like having a, a, like a pint of bitter yeah you know probably just one pint and then you know and people would be on the um, on the uh, what do you call it on the uh, washboard like making a song yeah like, oh, no it was yeah it was lively it's lively you know very lively and um and I think that again out of, out of hard times you know if you listen to reggae music it's a it's a music that is salvation and rejoice mm. and there's a positive message you know and there's also talking the truth and and i think that's what music has always been has been a way to express how you feel you know and sharing that feeling to other people and that's why certain tracks touch people and goes oh my god because mm. everyone got a feeling about stuff so if your songwriting isn't very good isn't about anything that's real you're f you're just failure because no one's it doesn't affect anyone trend setting great but when you get people that are going deep right lyrics Adele and people like that that's why they wing bid awards man because they say words Amy Winehouse in her time rest her soul I haven't got any shots of her but again you know it's that you know out of her desperation and a really tough struggle through life best songs ever written bruv yeah amazing. you know, and, uh, you know so amazing. all these people are oh it's all good no it ain't all good you know it, it doesn't it can get all better but you do need to have something that isn't great for you to to kind of you know Some sandpaper and smoothing off the rough edges but if you ain't got nothing rough then the whole thing's smooth sometimes you need to come from that kind of gritty grimy side to, yeah it's to, weird to, to, that, uh, and from such a low that you, you you become like a phoenix rising out of the flames well, as, a, as a as a writer do you know what it's funny that you you're very well spoken i must say and i love the way you put that that put that out there but it reminds me of myself uh, and I did a great thing um, I've done a great thing with the book but um, Marcus Barnes wrote the forward and there's, there's a thing in the forward where he's he actually shows that in the time when I started doing photography in the sort of mid 80s you know so early 80s mid 80s when I was at school and then college that wasn't a job that sold to young black boys you can't you know if you hear it to this day oh, I want to be a drummer and every, every parent will go that's dummy street we can't get a normal job I used to play drums as well and uh, so that thing of doing the thing that was that I'm not supposed to be able to do is kind of was my drive mm. as well because I was like well I don't actually want to be a plumber or an engineer I don't want to do all those labor jobs that everyone is gonna go and do it's you not that I'm, I'm a creative I'm you're an artist creative. You're not, you know yeah. so even when I was at school and I wanted to do, be in the art class and somehow I couldn't get in it they put me in pottery I'm like, you know, and a lot of the times when I was at school, it's quite difficult to me to follow the path that I wanted to for some strange reason. And that put me back a bit enough for me to go, do you know what? I've got a hobby. And it's, I like, as a snapper, I just like taking pictures. And I started that when I was really young. I started taking pictures when I was about 12. But what made you? What was that spark that lit that flame for you to pick up the camera? My mum, she's the spark and the flame of the, of the family and my whole entire life. And it was her ultimately that one day that I'd gone to go and get a bike at this auction where she took me to this auction and it was like a kind of public auction not, not a flash not Sotheby's or anything like that I can remember it quite well Royal Horticultural Society and there was an advert in the newspaper well, and it kind of was like a bloke down and down the you know around the market down the Roman you know and he's like in the middle of this hall <laughs> yeah. yeah I got this I got that oh yeah you watch this and uh, we went down there and I wanted to get a bike when we got there late actually there was not much left and he had just a lot of pile of stuff. I don't remember seeing very much left. And it was like, you know, I've got this, I've got this camera, like Kodak 126 in a box. Love, he comes with a film, comes with a flash, blah, blah, blah. And my mum said, do you want that? And I was quite disappointed I wasn't getting a bike. That is really the truth. You yeah, know, when you're young, you know, when you set your heart on something and you're yeah, young. Yeah. And you, I probably told my mates, I'm getting a bike, I'm going to get a bike. And then I did, I got there and I'm like, oh my God, I'm not getting a bike. Yeah. So all this peer pressure, invisible peer pressure that we give ourselves when we're young, trying to impress other people all the time. And in the end, you know, the, I, she, the guy offered the camera and my mum said, do you want it? And I went, yeah, go on then. I was reluctant as well. I was like, all right then, go on, I'll have it. And then I got that. And when I got it, it was kind of like, I wasn't a kid anymore, really. I wasn't a toy. You know, I was probably about 14, 13, 14. Now I wasn't that old. I was about twelve, man, because I was in secondary school. I remember, so I was, but at, I was a little bit. I was overdeveloped, but I was quite advanced, 
when I was young, and you know, it's when I was playing my, when people was, we had practical toys, so I'm just trying to remember it really, Scare Electrics, Sabutio, uh, um, and then before that I was on Mammoth, um, which is the steam engines, Meccano, which now they use Lego plastic. I've had Meccano. The dominoes as well, do you have the dominoes? Dominoes is a game, but I never really played it because the game. But listen to me, man, you see the Jamaican people, yeah? Don't ramp. You see my uncles and them, yeah? Mm. When my uncles and my family were having their little gets togethers, your men always sit down at some point around the table and get the old rum out and just get the dominoes out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you see them start slapping the table like they're trying to <laughs> kung fu chop the table in half. <laughs> Dominoes is like, that's like a man's game! It is! No, that was not, you wouldn't be getting involved in Dominoes, you, no. you'd be watching that from a distance going, Why, why? Yeah. Um, what I was more intrigued with, I reckon, when I was really young, was the music. Mm. I was interested in the music, because my first and for, first thing I did was play drums. As, a, as a, any form of expression and creativity, I was a drummer, I loved the drums. There's a lot of beats in my life and stuff, and I got into that quite young and I, I was lucky enough when we moved into Primozilla area that a lot of my friends were also quite creative you know and then you realise you're near to Dingles then you realise you're near to the Rounders and you realise you're living in what Camden is which is a creative musical artistic creative melting pot yeah, yeah, yeah unbelievable yeah, yeah. Yeah. and so again without even trying it no disrespect but when you live in the block in the ends and that's your surroundings you reflect your surroundings and you'll see now how kids literally like that in the end I got out of the block, out of the ends, so I reflect the world, and that was the thing I loved about photography. When I got into it, I would just walk around with that little snap camera. I never even used to take pictures; I just, just look through it. My imagination was doing it all. To this day, I can go around without a camera and not feel like, oh, I wish I had my camera on me, because every single moment of your life, while you've got vision, even if you ain't got it, is a snapshot. And and, that, and to be able to, that's because I used to look and look and look and I was intrigued by what I was looking at the thing about the camera was I could it was like a little world in there it was like and I remember talking going back to the, the mod Parkers I remember when I was young my mum bought me one of them green Parkers that wasn't a mod one but it was a Parker with a fur collar that's right we yeah, had the black like one a the, snorkel the one. one yeah yeah, snorkel, black, yeah. blue and green they were black blue and a green one yeah that's right yeah and then I, then, I had the black one yeah. I used to zip myself into that I was in my own little world I'm very happy like that with my little brother, it? you know, it's like when I got into the dark room and printing, uh, I was gone, timeless, I didn't have any care what was going on outside the dark Cause room. Because I've done a photography course as well, I've got a BTEC National Diploma in Photography. Oh, I've and I've got a DATEC Certificate of Photographic Laboratory Skills. Did you really? Do you know what, Norm, Norm? Longest, you... longest course yeah. title I've ever heard in my life. Your day tech photographic. But, 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 <laughs> you know, how, how great was it in the dark room, you know, developing oh, your it. own photos with the red light and all that and the chemicals. Yeah, yeah, the yeah, light. safe light. Like, yeah, I loved it. And that, that was, that was, I was addicted to that. You know, like now people are in the studio and they're making tracks or bedroom DJs. They're just in there mixing, mixing, yeah, switching. Yeah. I was in the dark room learning how to print. You was learning your craft. I was learning, I was enjoying my, my hobby. I learned how to make photographs um look like professional what we call amateur photography in those days yeah um and so that was my thing and then music was my other love i ended up working in a music shop selling musical instruments i was only like you know an assistant sort of you know saturday job saturday boy job but that turned into a full-time job so i could afford my hobby and that was how I did it, you know, I'd, I'd bob a job, wash a car. Yeah, well that's make, that, what's you know, that then? Beg mum for an extra quid, you just know. like, you know what I mean? And then I learned how to earn so I could go and buy a film and yeah. paper. Bloody hell, you want to go in the dark room now? You do not want to think about it. Really I mean, expensive. Oh my days, I don't know yeah. where they're coming with the prices. I mean, Kodak stopped being Kodak for years when the digital world came along, because film, you know, and I come from the film analogue, as you said it before, old school, which is what we're <laughs> working with here in a way. Uh, but it's not that it's old, it's true school. Yeah. You know, and to be honest, you know. Who was who was kind of inspiring you as a photographer? Was anyone inspiring you or was you just learning yeah, your craft? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, you know, the really good, I have a really good friend, Zach Ove, and he's also a fellow artist. I mean, he, he, he did a lot of stuff with his father, dear Horace Ove, he passed most recently. Uh, one of the first, in fact, the first black filmmaker to come and make a film called Pressure mm. about, you know, uh, what it's like being, he was first generation Windrush people that had come over here, but he was a creative already from Trinidad and he was already a filmmaker and a photographer. And I think, you know, he would have inspired me because that, 
you know, and Zach inspired me, and all my mates, well, we're all inspired, but I actually used to like, well, I still do, Don McCullen hmm. as a photographer, and he was, <clears throat> he was a hard, he said this, <clears throat> he's like one of those hard-hitting reportage photographers that was renowned for his war work, but also renowned for doing the work going up into these really tough areas in Great Britain and all over the world. And uh, he's really interested in, in the real aspects of real life. So he's post-war, you've got mm. stuff up north, the coal mines. Wow. You know, when you see Don McCullough's black and whites, bruv. Whoa! Amazing. Pow! Hard blacks, hard whites. Bill Brown was another um, photographer. He's another, strange enough, I think he's German, Swiss or something. But for some reason, he lived in, in Belsos Park. And I'd, I knew of that. Uh, and the, the Irvin Penn, these are the great photographers of the, you know, between the 30s and, and 50s and 60s if you like and and to this day you know you know john kind of still going I mean, these guys you know they went to vietnam war they did all covered all that stuff and that's kind of the imagery that we were getting at that time in the magazines in the papers you used to love a sunday magazine paper it's a dream of getting your photographs in the sunday ma so sunday times that was the one on the observer <laughs> these are like <laughs> epic titles and so you know and i go out to my mate's house and some of them some of their parents was buying that you know those national geographic would inspire me as well as the fact that so i was natural growing. geographic love that magazine yeah. all day long um because you could see the world with natural geographic you open yeah. a page of natural geographic and you get an aerial shot not yeah. with a drone i don't know how they were doing i don't know how this is such a long time ago but you see this incredible landscapes this incredible world that you've realized it's not all so dismal it's the bricks and mortar that i'm living around in sort of chalk farm you know and now go we used to go playing over the railway we were playing in air raid shelters i had no idea there were air raid shelters we used to think they were like old coal sheds they were actually air raid shelters there was, there's still some here well i remember my mum and dad telling me they used to play on bomb sites yeah that's what i'm saying bombs, mate bombs, bombs, for all bombs. i know we was jumping around on bombs unexploded bombs yeah i remember that old iron brown iron stuff and they love yeah. Those big round ones that they used yeah. to drop on the sea and stuff. I remember seeing one of those for real life. I mean, it's like throw stones at it, you ping, ping. <laughs> that was normal. You know, yeah. it's you mad. Know, isn't yeah, it? we were pretty tough as, as young and so. Um, how happy was we doing that? Very happy, we? very happy. Yeah, and you never used to cry no. that quickly. You were much we stronger. We were hardened, than... mate. We were hardened. Oh, yeah. We were brought up with the slipper and like. Yeah. You know, we were stepped out of line, man. You're going to get the slipper or the Oh, the yeah, definitely. Oh, definitely. Or the definitely. belt or whatever. But then that was also good for. for 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 your agility your, you know getting your, your agility and your physical um you know techniques together so when you could you learn how to dodge <laughs> and then you know you, you know, now it's just a little shouting in the ears and then shouting in the ears never got you to get one round the back of the yeah, ear you we feel was that drilled. we was drilled yeah respect. now you, you get taken to court for doing that to your child we now. was drilled respect i swore my dad once and he goes right i'm gonna clean your mouth out he put a bar of soap in my mouth ah. and made me eat a bar of soap. I, I've, I've really, very really swear to this day. He drilled, drilled. What a lesson. Drilled respect into me. I'm so glad I didn't live in your house, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to go on about the way that I used to get punished, but it made me the person I am. Yeah. And it certainly was a real, real, real kind of world that, uh, that I came out of, which I think kind of I reflected in, in my interests and the things that were really happening. So continuing with the the com uh, the combination of the music and the photography then in those days there were loads of live bands on all the time and like i say i was in an area where you know you could go to a pub and there'd be a band in the back room and you know when we started going and having our first drinks you know oh yeah we actually were underage but we'd lie and until we were just allowed in the garden or we were old enough but there was that thing of the band the music you know you know and that's where even our group we used to try and get gigs in pubs because that was a normal thing now of course you got in the pub it was a dj yeah, they're everywhere fine. and i don't mind that but i do like the back room where the live band is and i know now there's lots more live bands again because you that they say is old school it's not that's traditional making of music you know creating yeah. creating well yeah you're sharing energy with other people you know yeah. we love that and everyone loves it. you see everyone goes to a live get, got a gig they're like oh my god this superpower that you get from people um performing together and also um just you know vibing together on that sort of that, it's all about energy really it's so even if you go to a football match i'm not a big fan of football or that, but i do get it and the most exciting thing for me about football is, is that when something on the pitch happens and all of the crowd feel it at the same time <laughs> that's immense that's immense you see you're part of something it's just the most human you feel yeah and you know? without without a shadow of a doubt but let's uh, i'll tell you what no, let's move on to the uh the hip big hip the big hip-hop question i mean <laughs> what, what, what was you know what was the spark 
that lit that flame, which basically, you know, it blew the roof off 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 the UK when hip hop or, or rap music first hit the uh, hit, hit hit the streets of the UK and London. I mean, what was that that spark that really kind of you know you you was like, I'm, I'm into that. I, I that, you know, was it a certain track you listened to, or was it like um, was it a certain documentary or film that you'd watch, like Wild Star, or all of that stuff? Yeah, because when that was all the first time we'd been receiving this, I mean, Wild Star was it was a big, but you know, um, Beat Street. Yeah, you know, there's a lot of the first. I mean, again, we were watching to the, looking to the Americans. They didn't really have a youth culture or something that was basically. I couldn't see myself in the UK. I couldn't see anything that represented. And that's why I think that with the music, you know, without it feeling like, oh, well, that's my dad's music, or well, that's my mum's music, that's not really our sound. And I definitely weren't into punk music as I loved it. I liked it, but it, I didn't. I didn't start looking like a punk. What I liked the look of was when I saw Black Americans, Latino brothers. And again, I got to give Zach a lot of props for this because I've known Zach since I was at Primozil School, and. Um, that was that, 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 that Zach Ove, my buddy. That I, got, like, I kind of got into photography with him, oh, yeah, and yeah, also yeah, he'd, yeah. All, he'd yeah. had American connections, right? So he'd already been to America. He was like the coolest kid in the school. I mean, he used to have the flipping, was he, rocking the he was rocking the Puma Sways way before anyone I ever knew in really? this country. Yeah, and he was like, bro, <laughs> oh, and you know, he had, the, he had the bad boy little Pumas on, and that was yeah. like, oh, but there was a lot of things, you know, early 80s. I would say, I'm you know, rapper's delight. But when that track, yeah. which was a, felt like disco, but it was this melody, and, and these, you know, it was this just and the message as well that came much later in a way, to be honest, yeah. you know, in a sense. But yeah, all around that, all of that stuff that was first time hearing, Curtis Blow, that was our Curtis music, was all well, of them. I mean, yeah. I'm not going to try and I'm getting that point where I'm trying to pinpoint the yeah, moment yeah, where because yeah. you, you end know, up becoming like a train spotter, isn't yeah. It? But I, that's one thing I didn't yeah. do. I'm just train that's being spotted. I never wanted to be the one spotter, so. I can't really say there's any one point. It was a time of our lives. And it was developing. That what was happening. It was not even developing, brother. It was just about to grow. Mm. And it was our mm. thing. And across the whole planet, anyone who's from that generation went, bing, this sounds like, it's for me. Oh, the message, those are words for me. You know, these sort of songs are for me, Planet Rock. Oh, come on. No, oh, no, no, planet rock. Burp, burp, burp. Then you had also, you had a... Uh, rock, yeah, rock you, at your own risk. Uh, you know, all that sort all of stuff. But also part. the music that they took, they were inspired by, you know, um, the Zulu Nation, all that stuff, was still something that you knew, you know, like, and that's where we are the understanders of the breaks because the hip hop is the music that would take brilliant records mm. and take the little bit of rhythm bit out there. The sample or the break. The break, yeah. that little bit. Right to this day, man, you see them I now. Make the whole track with you that see them now, break. or they just get some any old music and just just get that. <laughs> whoever it is, you know, no one was doing that before hip hop, bro. Before that, people were actually playing the musical instruments. This is why I was a drummer. I will play a bit of bass. You know what I mean? I can strum a little guitar. I'm not really heavy on a, I'm more of a percussion, more of a rhythm making kind of guy. I'm more, that's why drums is me. And I was a really good drummer. In terms of like elements of hip hop, <laughs> I suppose in terms of elements of hip hop, you could really say that photography really is an element. I mean, because it's, it's so Well, creative. it's visual, isn't it? Hip hop is a visual thing as well. It's not just audio. It's a culture hip hop, it's not rap. Yeah. Rap is yeah. one element. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So you've got graph artists, you know, it's all artistic and creative expression as well. You've got DJs, you know, you have. Um, um, graffiti artists, graffiti um, artists. beatboxers. Um. All of these ways of trying to get your sound out DIY without equipment. I mean, beatbox is the best one. You know, that's a drum kit right there. And I used to do some really weird stuff you like that. No, I wasn't, but I used to. I'm going to get I'm going to get I'm going to some weird stuff. Rhythm talk, yeah. At the same time, someone was developing a thing called beatbox. And that was that just encapsulate anyone's imagination straight away. How so, good, how good was Dougie Fresh and Dougie Fresh? He, he was one of you know when you had you know all Dougie Fresh and Fat Boys and all that. Really? Blah, blah, blah. You know what you heard, yeah, right? Skinny boys as well. Blah, 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 blah. When you what you heard was somebody, bruv making the sound of music with his mouth. Mm. So Dropping you know, next day you're a boom, back, back, back. Boom, back, boom, boom, go back, go back, go boom, and if you make it, I can rap it if I give it, give it, go. Suddenly we're able to make music. Are you mad? What? 
without having to ask permission. Oh my days, you know. And that was real. That's what it is about. That I think is that it's self-sufficient. You know, um, creativity, isn't it? Hip hop as a as a massive, thing, massive. especially graphics. Well, graphics like well, yo man, I'm gonna put my artwork anywhere I like. What? Are you sure? Yeah, I want it to be seen. I want, oh, oh let, let me just do the, let me just get on the, on the metro and just do some subway art. Boom. Driving on. Well, are you mad? But then all of a sudden your artwork's going from Brooklyn clear over to Manhattan on a train and everyone's going, oh, dude. Well, you know, it's like, but sometimes when I think about it, in the UK, the artwork's all brilliant, but it doesn't go anywhere. And then you see well, a train gets bombed or something. Oh god! I wish they just let more trains out sometimes. It's like goose, goose bump, isn't it? Oh, it's goose, like, and also, bump. if you imagine, imagine TFL <laughs> transport for for laughers. <laughs> imagine they um they said, okay, what are we going to do? We're going to commission two or three of the best sort of graffiti artists, and we're going to allow them to do f one whole train completely, the whole train. It would be the most beautiful train Could anyone would imagine? ever see. Could you imagine? Easy. Mm. Yeah, but you're coming with your little two rainbow here or whatever. Come on, man. There's artists that. Oh, they do that as well as um, um, art on the underground. Bruv, have you seen that rubbish? Come on, man. There's some heavyweight artists out there be getting some contemporary minimal art. Uh, people get excited when they see excitement. And that is what hip hop is. Excitement, man. It's like, well, it's just when you go into a beat, it's too heavy. Like, the shoes, banging, outfits. I even brought this one especially for you I today. I can see that. I can see I that. I brought this yeah. out especially for the Ultra Cat. Listen, mate, my eyes are on that jacket. You man. know what like, I mean? I said, let me come with the, uh, that is the collab. That is popping. Come with the collab. Again, though, it's DIY, it's hip hop. See, Adidas will go mad for this. Gucci will go mad for it because they haven't done this collab. Would That's you? what we like about hip hop. People, you make your own thing. Yeah, DIY, yeah. you suckers. Yeah. Take that big rich thing over there, strip, tear it apart, and re sew it up over here to the point of where the big companies are trying to copy the road, trying to copy. We inspire the world. We would have known that 50 years ago as we celebrate 50 years of hip hop. We didn't even think about that. Personally, I didn't care. It was just our own little world finally. We had something that we could call ours. And then you start finding out that the kids in South London. They're also into it, so they were way ahead of me. My first time when I really went, it became a physical thing for me. Was about 1985, um, when I was at college. Now this time I'm 15, going on 16. Yeah, that's right, because I got into college just before I was 16, and they let me in because I was actually a really good photographer. But I've been in a dark room since I was 12. So when I rocked up to college as, with my little portfolio, I remember Matt Campanil. He was the head lecturer at the time. I remember his eyes and he popped out of his head and, and I thought, what, what, and he's going, whoa, d did you do all these? And I went, yeah, casually, like, yeah, yeah, I've got a little, little dark room at home, I'm, I'm step that out, me to build a little dark room in the cupboard and all this stuff, and he went, wow, well, do you know what, and he said, he was, you know what, I think I can get you on this course, you know, it's only a couple of months in the age thing, but I know, I think you should be on this course, because he saw the potential of a seriously good photographer, I had no idea my photography was that good until I was trying to get to college, hoping that, he, he couldn't believe I had examples of work. He's not, he said, everyone else is coming. They want to learn photography. You've come here. You're already a bloody photographer. <laughs> they, they can't, can you imagine? He would have thought, oh my God, finally. Not a student that's been rejected and he's come here because he's trying to find them. I mean, no, he's got options. He's not really interested. He's actually had someone who was really interested well, you said, in You were self-teaching yourself. So would you, totally learn, self -taught, yeah. would you learn in like, the aperture and all yeah, that? Yeah, from thing? that magazine photo. Then I got my... It ain't, like now, it ain't like nowadays, Norm, where you whip out a digital oh, yeah, camera and like, you, like, you just shoot because it's on automatic. This yeah, is in a day yeah. where you had to mess about yeah, with yeah, the setting. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It was, you know, a, it was a real craft. Yeah, it still is as well, and you know, and I think that anyone who learns the basics of capturing uh, light and um, you know and speeds of um, movement, if you can art, uh, you know, if you can, you can you learn the, the art of those two important things, just to get the picture onto the film. If you imagine, you have a blank piece of paper, and you get a pen that's got black ink in it, and then you put that onto the paper. Eventually, you work out how to actually write. Mm. Yeah, mm. and it's very important art. It's a very basic thing. Like it's the same with film. You know, you have to learn how to get the image that you see onto that p piece of film. Sometimes you take a picture and it's all really overexposed, really bright. So you're gonna have to shut that down a bit, and you have to learn how to expose properly. Of course, automation it'll take the dummy out and it'll just do it all for you. So the least you can do is try and compose a good photograph because the camera will take a brilliant photograph if it's digital right now. They call it idiot proof because you don't want to have a customer who's dis disappointed. So when they take pictures, you don't want it to be complicated. 
you want it to be easy well no that's not creative that's just out of ease but as soon as you start messing about with it creatively yeah learning about depth of field depth of focus yeah. Yeah. how you can pinpoint that's you know, hip-hop that that's hip-hop because you're, you're there you go you're, you're there you go i'm just talking right. about taking pictures of film it's the same thing isn't it? like hip-hop scratching or yeah. emceeing or, or, or taking a sample from a, from, boom. from a break boom boom you know you're you're getting creative you're yeah. you're developing you're developing i think it's also a very strong thing of it being a doing it yourself creativity i think it's a very important part of it is you you can think it and imagine and dream it but can you actually dj mm. <laughs> a yeah. lot of people talk to talk but they yeah, can't yeah, walk yeah, 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 <laughs> you know yeah, what i mean yeah, yeah. And it's very important to learn to walk because it's okay to talk to talk but it's even more fun to do that thing you know and that is the thing about it becoming a reality and i think that i found my niche that whatever i did in life i would do it photographically i would always look and always have it interested to look a bit further and it's a great thing for learning how to communicate with other people because then you get onto the level of where trying to make feel, people feel or even being in a position where you want to catch a picture and you, you so you've got to learn how to get into the room and and how to appreciate them sometimes i've been around photographers and they just go and barge through their camera and they're wondering why and everyone's going what would that and then when you're behind the energy is like who do you think he is that's not a good look you need to learn how to be you know courteous in your environment and that again is a very important thing that's nowadays another skill. that's another, that's another skill, skill but it's a very big part of it you know it's like a rapper or an artist you know you've got to work your audience some people got attitude when, and they got attitude on stage attitude off stage and it's hard not to see that when they're performing so they kind of you think god if you're a bit nicer i could actually enjoy it but i can't remember the last time you were like i'd be for that guy you keep going on and on and on and you're really good but it's you're just you know and it's that thing of focus you know like you know talk about prince and them people man michael jackson when them guys turn their switch on boom boom let's like don't ramp oh and you know same with a lot of hip-hop artists loads of them incredible and when that happened these artists you know mc light all, all these artists they were kicking salt and pepper queen latif all them early golden age artists they came out of the they came out of the streets Mm. So and they, they they were making sure that people heard them, heard them and they were making sure that you know when you turn mm. around you see the chunk gold earrings it's mm. very American I know, mm. but no one looked like that. Mm. Nobody looked like that, and that was a, an identity that belonged to us, if you like, because we created our own identity. We had our own thing that we could say, yeah. There was no hip hop before our generation. It was bebop, R and B jazz funk yeah all right but we nowadays later coming out of years after hip-hop you've got all these different variations from trap grime and right down to jungle mcs you know the mc thing comes out of the sound um sound system with the toasters you know euro and them guys 1960s early 70s these man's that the first time you got Jimmy come on put the plate on the thing yeah and as i say i'm on the mafia come follow we in our areas them kind of things there yeah that's the real origination of man expressing what's going on around him in his world live and direct using a dj and a microphone then them guys in the states come with the two decks and cut in between the bricks so then it's so it's all like i said it before levels it's levels because originally it was about the selector one deck one deck yeah one yeah deck, and, and that's right and then the echo chamber that's right and then so you put the music on but in between when the dealer they say we're that tune man and then they, they, it was all right to have a gap but it's, right now sometimes i think to myself it's too noisy man you're just going from like i, I mean i in this session the other day and i was like you can stop emceeing for a second you know because you know dj as well that's why it's like no man it's my only job to talk on the man to go for my walk and i say one i say shut up for a second man let the music play in the man but so back in the end times it wasn't such a rush and so when you hear that really laid back kick back kind of stuff people love that because it's like well, there's no rush you can really sit i love don't get me wrong i got love on a fast chat but a good mc knows when to shut up yeah you know and a good lyricist what? knows when the song is complete or or you know actually that short little verse is enough it doesn't have to be a double long verse and you can repeat it because that's your message that you're trying to get to people and once again you know that's an art form within itself yeah yeah knowing yeah. knowing when to stop or knowing when to come yeah come back in with with with, with your sound um actually one thing i'd love to talk to you about norm is uh record digging because record digging back in the day and sniffing out your crop mm. you know like hunting down your tunes 
you know, where was you kind of record digging? Because the record I ain't really do record records sh- digging, bro. I'm never. a musician, yeah, not really. I buy records. I used to go and buy a few records, but you see, like, you get these nerds, sorry, geeks, nerds, rec- uh, people that love record digging, collectors, connoisseurs of music, they go out looking for that l- seven inch. You lost me on that. I love them people though. When I go to the yards and I look at the collections, like my mate B Shiver's got this seven inch collection, an old school record collection. Like well it's, done. it's a wall of record. Mm. Man's all paying £200 for a single. Mm. But you know, when you see the full hip hop, <laughs> the songs he's got on sevens with the picture, picture, picture sleeves. See, that, that, that was me, man. I was, when people were collecting records, all I was interested in was looking at, wow, look at that shot, though. Oh, really? So you was more, you was more into the story? Bruv, I can never remember, you know, can people you know me? Can you, you know, when you're me? standing there and you're like, yeah, but, mm, 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 this tune, and then someone who's a geek and knows everything, you see this tune here, the original Brett was like, shut up, bruv! Man, trying to listen to, I don't need a, a, a nocturnal breakdown of who, I don't care, but then I understand it because they're like, yeah, but where I'm looking at the pictures, where I'm thinking about the image of what they, they look like and loving the actual music. Some people are like, nah, bruv, that's the AK, um, AK4 he's using on that one. I'm like, bro, I don't care what drum machine is on this track. All I know is the track is heavyweight. So I'm on the other side. I've got my own things that I'm kind of got my own vices that are in a different area. And I, and I think it's bigger because than just... Because with, with vinyl, it's mm. not just, as you just said, it's not just about the, the, the track. It's also about the whole Aesthetics, package. Aesthetics, man. Everything, it's the whole yeah, package. yeah. So as you said, like, you know, the, the, the artwork on the actual uh, sleeve itself. You that. was really interesting in that. Pivotal. Have you got some favourite, like, a few favourite... Oh. I mean, Jan- Janet Beck... Beckman, uh, oh, yeah, for, yeah, he Jeanette, some amazing folk like, yeah, folk you know, it's really weird. I met Jeanette Beckman for the first time in uh, last year. Uh, I was in the photographer's gallery, she had her book come out, and uh, she was doing a signing thing there. And I thought, you know what, I'm gonna go down to this man because, um, and then when we went, when I went down there and she started championing me, I was like, she's I literally got, I went and bought one. 40, 50, 45 quid or whatever, it's proper hardback, oh, it's a proper big fat book. And I stood in a line, like everyone else, waiting to get my book signed. You know, that's the kind of guy I am. You know, I just go along and just go right back to, I came down here to get Jeanette Beckman's photography book, because I love photography. Her work is sick. She shot, shot some of the artists that were, ah, oh, some of the biggest artists, when they were just before they were even artists practically. Some of my favourite album covers, um, Eric B and Rakim and all that stuff. Yeah, Friedman yeah, yeah, is one yeah. of the first photographers that would have inspired me of my, of sort of, older than me as well, you know, that guy. Some wicked, well I mean, Joe Conzo as well, some wicked. Yeah, I didn't, guys. Guys. I didn't know all them guys. I didn't know all them guys. Actually, it cuts off because them guys weren't, you never heard of them guys. People like Glenny Friedman, I'd heard of because he was working for, sk- uh, for a skateboard magazine because uh, he's into skaters as well and you know he shot all that early stuff of the pipes and tony alva dogtown wow. see i'm skater generation which yeah, is yeah, pre-hip-hop yeah. bruv you get me a 70s isn't it yeah proper like, 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 like lsd it? london skates dominates bruv south bank crew do you know what i mean i'm i, I would say i was i want to be one of those guys i was a grim i was a gremlin compared to them but i grew up with all them bad boy skaters you know what i mean and that kind of flair so when Jeanette beckman was coming there, i thought whoa i've got to get that book signed when I met her and I got up to the table and I went hi and, and she looked up at me and I looked at her we see you know we're friends on the IG and all that sort of stuff and we've kind of had banter we've I've asked her advice about stuff and we've talked we're not talked actually heard her voice but we've just had that kind of notes you know and, 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 and messages and stuff DMs and anyway when I met her it was like meeting an old friend you know and she jumped up Normski man and then like, we realized like, like we never you. met yeah, uh, yeah, we've known yeah. each other forever. She's watched my work. I've watched her work. Mm. And it was honestly two of the world's leading photographers were just like two little kids, just, yeah, as, just humble as humble as fuck. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. I'm seriously, really, she, like she's a really nice lady. And also, we have a lot in common. Shoot at the same time, but definitely, she was way ahead of me when it comes to shooting. To be fair, she's way ahead of me. And I think for her to see other people doing a similar thing, what that does is it adds to your knowing that you're definitely on the bottom of something because other people are doing a similar thing and it makes you feel good especially when you're good at something um but that was a beautiful moment and um and very quick i think i met her again at another uh, big show and then i went to another exhibition of hers you know um she's probably going to be one of the happiest people to know that i've got my book complete because i talked to her 
when she did, I said, how did you do it? And she said, yeah, well, you know, she told me how she got this book together and it was all through the lockdown. And I was like, right, so hang on, this is your first book. I didn't realize that, you know, and, uh, and this is my first book. And so and I said before, I said before I say again, is that you kind of have to, you have to actually live quite a whole life to create a history. So you can't really do a full portfolio of work in a week, you know, it's like a few months, it's built up enough images to say that that's a full portfolio over a couple of years, you, you know, then over like a couple of decades, you know, and then, you know, say 30 years in, you can have 272 pages of rock solid hardback, which is about a third of the hip hop pictures I've ever taken is in that because I couldn't get every picture in the book. Oh, I'm, 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 you I'm can't really, do that, you know. I'm, I'm really buzzing to be talking about the book. Uh... Well, you know, we're leading to that though, because it's interesting because I was inspired by people like Jeanette on the level of believing in my craft because they were like, yo, your stuff is heavy. You're like the British version. People have said that you're like the British version of Jeanette Beckman. And I'm mm. like, whoa, no way. Mm. She's way like, I don't see myself in a way, but then it's not for me. And I've put that in the book. I didn't really take the pictures for me of all these people. I took the pictures to show all these people how brilliant they look. And you love you love black and white as well, wouldn't it? Yeah, I love black and white. Um, I guess another thing I'm very proud of is that the majority. Black and white uh, photos. I, I love. I love. Amazing. I'm again. I'm a, all my pictures in my book are all shot on film because mm -hmm. I'm from film time. No digital pictures in there. And a lot of the prints that are in there, which might have been black and white, I do a lot of things like when I was in because I'm a darkroom technician in that sense. So I, I would manipulate my pictures. I used to do old school style. I would paint them. That was my yeah. my way of you know. Yeah, I did, like, the, yeah, yeah not paint yeah. really well, mm. but colour them in like colouring in. But I coloured them in well. Some of them, you know. And then I do some abstract stuff, which you'll see when you get a copy of that. But you know, I think that um, you know, it was always about enhancing what was in front of me. And then I couldn't wait to show it to someone for them to go. Oh, that looks wicked. I loved it. But it, the real joy you get is when someone else loves it. Yeah, it's not really about me. You know, it's all about what I'm seeing. And so I've done a few exhibitions, I've had my work. My thing was always very quickly getting my work into magazines, getting my work into papers, getting my work printed. So that was how you become a professional. So you're now being paid to capture something for someone else's memories. So that's the joy in it. Ah, oh, hi, can you come down? We've got, a, you know, a, we're going to have a, a, an unveiling. I used to do unveiling things for Camden Council, stuff like that. So that's a reportage, you know, news, newsworthy reporter sort of thing, going to the local council jumble sale or some woman, some local woman at the youth centre uh, who is related to our family wanted someone to come and take a photograph of her while she gave birth. <laughs> wow. You know, and there I am in, 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 a, in a blimmin' ward in the hospital. With your camera? Taking a photograph of this baby coming out of this lady. I mean, that's the kind of crazy stuff. I didn't really, I don't have those pictures to look at, I can't read really what I want to look at, but I took them and gave them to them, and then the happiest of lives, because she wanted to capture that that's moment. What, that's what they wanted. And that's what yeah. I think photography is for, is photography is to capture a moment to share with others. That's why a book and stuff like that is so brilliant. That's why records, oh my God, whenever you've got a record sleeve, oh mate, i never forget when I did Derek B's record sleeve, mm. Good Groove. i never forget seeing that picture, shot on 35mm, Polaroid film, everything about that was wrong. I, I won't, I, I didn't have enough money to do two and a quarter inch. I come with 35 mil, it was two and a quarter for big man things, you know, them big hassle blasts and all that. It took me a while to work up to that. So I learned, and, I, and you know, and people reproduced my photographs with what I gave them. And when I saw that sleeve, I remember thinking, wow, I'd made it now, I'd actually made it to me. I was like, you know what, that's a record sleeve and my photo on it. And you know, and on the back, there's these other little teeny ones as well. And then it says, photography by Normski Anderson. That's sort my of nickname first kicked in, do you know what I mean? How, how did that, how did your name? New York, with my mate Dilip. I went to New York and uh, hanging out over there for a little bit. Because that's a proper hip-hop name. Yeah, yeah well, that's, that's why. Right. I was lucky I got to keep that name really because there was a Normski that I didn't know that was in the Rocksteady crew. That's right, yeah. Uh, in New York. And um, so, you know, I, I don't know how he spelt his name, probably the same way I spell it, but I was always, I think I nearly even tried to spell it with two E's name belt yeah i went in to go and get a name belt with norm skip with two e's that's right and it was like i'm not that f f big the belt was so yeah. wide there's no way you could call it a belt as i'm even i remember Dylan going I'm not sure you know it's a bit big isn't it and i went <laughs> <laughs> it's ridiculous yeah, he's through his, doors sideways he, yeah his 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 nickname was dill d-i-l-l -L. and so he got a really cute little four letter yeah, name yeah, belt yeah. and i was like mm. got like 20 letters he was trying to think norman didn't sound good at all did it norman 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 
No man, no norms is no norms, that's not good. And then he was like, how about Normsky? Because he'd heard that name, because he was out there studying at um the uh, music New York music um production thing he was doing at the an academy out there or something, university mm. in uh in NYU. And um yeah, and um he, he just said, What about Normsky? And I went and the reason why I liked the, the name Normsky, my initial thing that, why I said yes to that was because I used to like yogurt, strawberry mm. yogurt. And they used to have a yogurt brand called Ski. That's S right. That's right. I remember that? I used yeah. to love Ski yogurt. And I went, Norm Ski. Mmm, I like that. And boom. And that stayed. We've got the name N O R M S K I, with which I'm getting a replacement done because I don't know what happens to that. I had it in the VA Museum. Last time I saw it, it was on display at VA Museum. I ain't seen it since. And um, the, na the Norm Ski name belt. And that was it. And I just I had my hip hop belt, silver, chrome words, and a brass uh, bracket around it. Wow. Um, and then that's kind of how the name that just became my hip hop name, if you like. You know, like everyone's got a like, alter ego or whatever. But well, that was like wicked, my... it's a wicked name. But then it also, you know, I remember when I was doing photography for like Record Mirror magazine. By, by the way, Norm, Norm, I just noticed you're wearing an orange watch with your orange uh, top. So that that is you. You've got the yeah, thing always, there, always. Yeah, so? that, I got that from I got that from hip hop. I got that from the states actually. Uh, I got that from being from a black family. You never no, it looked good. No, you look wicked. But, but you yeah, always go, look go good. In, going, going back to the yeah, so the record mirror. <laughs> Thanks for noticing that. <laughs> no, no, I noticed you straight away. So um, yeah, going back to yeah, the record mirror. Record mirror magazine was a local music paper to me. Yes, a local in the sense of like it was in Morning Crescent. They used to be based, and um, <clears throat> and I used to go to gigs, and I'd take my camera, and I'd be right at the back and or I'd try and take photographs of live bands and then what I would do is I would then phone them up and say hi can I speak to the picture editor please and they say who's that and I say oh, it's a photographer uh, Norman Anderson and they say oh hang on a second and they say hello who's this I say, um, my name's Norman Anderson I'm a photographer and I'm just wondering um, if you had anybody reviewing the blah 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 concert last night because I was there with my camera and I got some live shots and they were like, oh, really? Actually, we do have it. Can we have a look at them? And I said, yeah, uh, of course you can. And they say, right, well, if you, you want to drop them off at the, at the, um, in the post room. Um, because everything then was no internet or anything. There was no emailing. You had to go deliver, mm. you know, and that used to have runners going up and down Fleet Street, which is when I was at college. It was one of my work experiences. I was actually working at the Fleet Street press agency in Ox in up near to uh, Mount Pleasant. And it was a wonderful, wonderful experience because I learned then that I didn't want to be a paparazzi press photographer because them guys are like wolves. Mm. But I became a paparazzi hip hop photographer. Documenting. But I was yeah, the head wolf. So, and it weren't like, there was a few of us, but when I was doing the early stuff, live stuff, it, took, it was really hard for me to break in because these big people had big lenses and they had what that was known as the photo pass. They were official. So when I um, dropped a couple of shots off, I think I dropped a shot off of Zap, Roger Troutman, who also is gone now, but Roger Troutman and Shirley, J Sheila Jordan was a singer. And I went to a gig at Hamilton Odeon and watched Zap Band, took some snaps. They're quite good, they're not brilliant, they're all right. And I remember um, sending send them and putting them in an envelope. You know, I'd go home, literally, print it up quickly on 10-8 because I learned how to print. And then I put them in the envelope and yeah, I actually you know, do it all. And back, back in those days, I had a Canon typewriter and stickers. Man used to type, photographed by Norman Anderson, little details, telephone number, the address, put wow. a stick on the back of the print. Have you still got any of them? Probably, yeah. Mm, wow. Yeah. Well, that's how that's I... Typewriter. Wow. That's how I used to do it. Yeah, no, the typewriter's dead and buried, but mm. but that kind of efficiency, <clears throat> you had to do that. I mean, sometimes you'd write on the back of a print and you'd realise that was really ugly, really unprofessional, looked really crap. So you tried to make it, finish it as well as possible. And I did pre uh, present it, because I did go to college and learn this stuff, yeah? Now I learned how to do a lot of stuff at college, all the practical stuff, film, design. I've done film, design, uh, art and design is the name of the, court, the, the actual lesson. Uh, black and white photography, theory of photography, practical photography, colour processing. We lot, uh, learned a lot, full time course, five days a week, you know, proper life, school hours, 9am till whenever. And, and sometimes you'd be in there in the dark room until late. I never had to stay in the dark room until late. Number one, I couldn't stand being in the dark room with other people because they're all really crap. And they just, you know, and I was well advanced. And uh, number two, I do like to be in a dark room on my own and just have and not have to think about anything except what's in front of me. But I did that, and I took them down, and I was they they used my picture. Yeah, you know, I think you get about twelve pound fifty for a certain size or fifteen pound. If you're lucky, you got a picture half 
a, page, a quarter of a page was really big. Years later, I was working for Record Mirror and I was doing the covers for them. But, you know, I started at the bottom and worked my way up. And the only reason why I got up, and not to the top, but I got up was because my work was good. My work was good, you know, and that's, and I always say that to a lot of people, you know, just get good at what you do. Money and work will come, but if you're no good, you're not ever going to get any of that. So just want to be good. A lot of people are quite, they, I find a lot of people, they sort of, not, yeah, the, the, the other way is like a lack of esteem. Some people are like, oh, it's not this, it's not that. I go, you know, you've got to believe in yourself more. I broke every rule I learned. I learned how to do things properly, and then I was like, okay, this is boring now, because it's all looking like everyone else's work. And I never wanted myself to look at like anyone else's work. I when, I look, when I look at, you know, Bill Brandt and Irving Penn and these are photographers, you know, Henry Cartier Bresson, it's very, I can sort of, you could, he's, he's some of his work, in that period, it all looks like that period. So when it comes to my thing, I always wanted to make sure mine had a stand up. Glenny Friedman, first time I saw the fisheye lens, that guy used to be in, a, in the skate parks. He, he, he got a whole skate park. When he sees the guy coming out or doing a pop out or whatever, it's all, and you're like, whoa, and then Amazing. next thing I know, public Amazing. enemy sleeve. Mm. And the same name. Amazing. I was like, whoa, I've become a massive fan of even more because. I was into skating, and I, into, I, I, I wasn't a great skateboarder, but I was happy to look at these amazing skateboard pictures. I was did, always inspired by the vision, man. Did you um? Did you have? Did you love playing around with different lenses as well? Uh, bro, don't mess about. Yeah, all day long. What was, your favorite, what was your favorite kind of lens you used to love? Thirty-five millimeter lens 35. and a twenty-eight mil wide. Thirty-five was like a standard lens is a fifty millimeter, yeah, and it's supposed to be a standard lens. It's an interesting thing because it's not really. But if you think about what we can see, believe it or not, human beings, we can see 180 degrees. We don't believe it. If you've got 20 20 vision, I can, my peripheral view just saw a geezer walk come there yeah, before yeah, he yeah. came. Yeah. So we, you know, we're lucky like that. Our eyes can go that. I mean, like some animals, their eyes can see 360. And so we've got these new 360 cameras. It's two lenses that look that way. But that means we're getting 180 in front and back. So we, we, we got our planes in, in front of us. And so my favourite lens was the 35 millimetre lens because it was kind of how we see a little bit wide, but it, but not too wide, and it also wasn't too narrow. But the 28 mil, the wide angle depth, I love that. Then I got off 24 mil. Then I got a 17 mil. Then I got the fisheye. You know what I mean? So I've I, and wide, wide. I used to love wide. But I mean, another lesson I learned when I did one little short course. I did a course before I started college and before I got professional. I did a course when I was going to have a sort of school. I would have been about 13, 14 at that stage. And I remember there was a course in this photography place around the corner from where I lived. It was like a, you know, it, it was a beehive photogra photographic center or something. And they basically had a dark room and a small studio. And they used to have these little photographic clubs, photography clubs, you dirty old men to go down there. And some model would sit there like she was live drawing, and they'd be there taking pictures. Um, and I remember I went on a four week, once a week um, dark room techniques thing where this guy was gonna just basically teach us how to, to develop film. He wasn't going to teach us how to take pictures though. He came from New Zealand, Ray. And he goes, well, let me tell you something, mate. You don't need anything. You don't need like 20 lenses. All you need is a, one lens and a camera and a bit of film. That's all you need. And and, and I was standing there thinking, well, that doesn't sound right. <laughs> Everyone else is there going, yeah, well, what do you mean? Uh, so he goes, oh, okay. So let me give you an example. This is my really bad somewhere between Kiwi and Oz accent. <laughs> but he was this little kind of traveller guy with a beard, he was like a little beard. And obviously his mate said to him, if you come down, I'll give you a little bit of work if you want to do a little course. So he's in town for a minute. So he came with all this, listen, I'm just here for a lot. You know, I thought I'd do it. I'll do an hour every week for a month while I'm in London. Anyway, I'll teach you a little few things. Can't teach you how to take pictures. That's for your business, but I can teach you how to get your idea on a bit of paper. You know, and we're like, right, okay. And then you remember him saying, so, what is a wide angle? What is a telephoto? What is a standard lens? You know, oh, well, telephoto, you know, you can see a really long way with it. Uh, wide angle, well, you know, you see a lot in it. You know, it really sees a lot. And he goes, yeah. So, how am I going to do this with a 50 millimeter lens? You know, when you go out and buy a camera, they give you the 50 mil lens. It's a standard lens, they call it. So, how do you get a wide angle shot? And when it's easy, so say for example, I want to take a photograph with my telephoto of that door over there. Well, what I do with my 50 mil is I run all the way over to the door and get close to it. If I want to get the whole building, I'll go further back and get in a wide of it, you know? And I thought, oh my God, so obvious. So really all those other lenses are really just to change and warp to special effect. Mm. Admittedly, sometimes you can't get back enough. You can't go back. So you do need to go to a wide lens so you can see more in front of you. So they are, 
practical uses and then there's also the you know the creative uses of lenses but I was obsessed with the kit I was obsessed with I'd buy second-hand lenses I mean the first cameras had the screw-on thing and things used to be real cheap second-hand all day long for a while the friends lend me cameras and stuff I practice I basically experimented with whatever took pictures you know what I mean and um, so yeah I mean but I am one of those that you know that's but my geek so we go back to the geek thing but some people are digging for records I'm digging for bit, a new light meter, a try the next lens, <laughs> try that Vivitar 283 flash, that was the flash of all flashes, get the little softbox attachment so I can start to make it look like I'm in studio mode, but then I would take that and I'd be in the back alleyway. You, you was like, you was I was like, shooting like a studio, but I'm on location with like, you know, De La Soul, wow. behind Brixton Academy, just before they're about to go on stage. Oh guys, can I get a photograph? That was, I said this the other day and I didn't realise that I, preferred to photograph people before they performed or after they performed than so when they were performing the during the daytime when they do a sound check oh that, that's what I, I told i said that on an interview the other day you did and that's the lesson of life if you want to meet a band everyone knows that everyone knows that if you ever wanted to meet your favorite band don't go to the gig and like just go in the daytime go in the daytime and you'll see them they'll be there they might not be wearing all of that you know or it, their roadie will be there setting up but if you go a little bit they'll do the sound check Find us, sound check time is a time right and that's the time when you catch that's how i got ultra magnetic mcs yeah i went during the sound check incredible and i walked in the thing was i walked into ding was the door was wide open the door was wide open there was no one in there the guy's going yeah mike what check mike yo 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 and i'm thinking oh my god said g cool keith on the stage right now but quarter past three in the afternoon in chalk farm at the dingles and i'm standing in the background and you know the guys are like, yo who are you man i'm, like, oh, I'm just a photographer i thought i'd come down you're a photographer all right but again they would have gone oh this guy's a black guy you don't didn't no one heard of that that's a new thing bro black photographers hey man brand new thing so that was special to have that connection with people and that's something i really like to build on because i'm quite believe it or not quite personal quite shy as much as it seemed like I'm really public, I'm really out there, I can and have been, but it's kind of been forced on me a bit because when you're taking pictures, it was never about me, bro. It's always about, yeah, I've got my camera with me. And you when, know, I, I have the camera on show. When and people go, is that a camera? I go, yeah. And they go, oh, you're going to take some photographs? I go, yeah, is that all right? And then I said to them, do you mind if we go outside for a second and get a couple of shots in the daylight? And you know what? Having been in sound check for a minute, just before they're going to go, go and get some food or go and get changed and get their food and come do the gig, there was a sense of relief that I would feel with them, which is like, yo, man, yeah, let's get out. I need some air. Then so while we're out, I goes, yeah, so you guys, welcome to Camden. You know, I knew it really well. But like, yeah, this area's got dingles. This is like a Camden lot, Mark. On the weekends, it gets crazy around here, like loads of people. And they're like, yo, man, you know your shit around. This is cool. And I said, there's a really good little spot here, you know, with a really nice picture. And it was the cobbles. It was old English railway architecture right by the canal you know with the barges and all that go and i put them up there and they were like yo man because i knew i was in put, i was like yeah that kind of then they just gave me the shot bam 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 boom that's in the book too shot done went to the gig later and it was like you know there's another shot of this inside um where it's a bum rush and everything the back door's got kicked in and blah 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 and i'm pushed onto the stage and the shot the shots are all like oh you know they're wicked but i do like that moment of quality with with um with creatives as well when you just aren't on full performance mode when you're just like okay so you know just chill yeah just be chill i was so chill on the tour bus with lipping um cold chilling crew in 1988 um big daddy kane how, uh, how did you get on to go on tour same thing man okay. i went to the gig that i think they played at hammersmith man mm. well, no maybe it's brixton i think they might cold chilling might be in brixton went to the gig when I was going to the gigs, yeah, I was more interested at being at the gigs and listening and watching the performance than trying to take pictures. Yeah, I took some pictures on live, but when you looked at the big boys that were sent there to take pictures with all the big flash and the long lenses, mm. mine was only on some little equipment. Mine was on some intimate equipment I'm working with. My Olympus OM, by the way, I was an OM1, OM2 guy. I couldn't afford Nikon, I couldn't afford Canon, right? And I was very fortunate that I met a brilliant photographer, Eric Swain when I was growing up, who, who also went, you know what, you're good, you know, you're good, you are. I've seen your pictures, because I was best mates with his goddaughter. And um, and he used to, he's a different photographer from the sixties, and he used to take their annual birthday shots. So he loved these black and whites, and I used to love them. And uh, so I sort of based my kind of composition on my 70s, early, late, early 80s style of 
portraiture, which is the soft focus and the black and white. And um, he, he sold me his Olympus kit because he got arthritis and basically resigned. I think his eyes going as well, the rest is sold. But he, mm. he sold me a lot of kit because he wanted someone good to have it. And he thought I was the one. So I've been blessed by a lot of people who saw potential that I can't see to this day. I just got to get on with doing what I'm interested in, what I'm good at. But other people would tell me if it's good or bad. So was you, <coughs> was you using the Olympus back back on the uh, the Cold Chilling tour? Yeah, yeah. All, all of that hip hop, pretty much all of the hip hop stuff on 35 mil was all shot on that Olympus. <laughs> what, what, who, who was you taking photos of, like on that tour? Mm. Well, I wasn't really on the tour. They were on tour in England. And it was Biz Marquee, called Big, uh, Big Daddy Kane. Oh, that Biz Marquee one is Yeah, yeah Roxanne Shantae. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Roxanne, when she had the, the big earrings. Yeah, she's fast asleep. But you know, I've got some live stuff. You know, I, I would. Bro, I just followed them around. They went to the radio station to do Radio London interview. I was there. You know, people asked me how and why because I was the f photographer of the time, bro. That's what you do when you're a photographer. Like, where can I go? Where's it happening? I'm running around with all the homies on the streets at all. I, I had no interest for some. And sadly, I've got a really small amount of real people. I was running around, following these rappers, you know, a couple of crowd shots to make them feel happy. But it was always about these artists. I always wanted to get these artists. Those are the ones that really were beaming the energy that I was like, completely like, whoa. You know, I got a shot of Big, uh, Big, Big Daddy Kane in when he's in performance mode, jumping, and it's all blurred. But he was a bad, he still is a bad boy dancer. When him and Scoop come up and start doing that running man dance they used yeah, to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you know, with the flat top hair, doing yeah, that. heavyweights, top, heavyweights. Yeah. So, you know, but then we had our people coming up now, so they got in the UK scene, you know what I mean? Cause you got you got a wicked one of like Demon Boys. As Demon well, Boys first shoot they second. Sh well, yeah, there's two shots of Demon Boys in my book. Is it? Because the broad the Broadway Farm shot is the one that was for their album recognition. So what what did did Demon Boys get in touch with you, or did you get in touch with them and say like we're gonna? No, they were signed to Music of Life Records, and I shot all of Music of Life Records pictures. Ah, yeah. Right. And, wow. and they had already done some shoots before I came along. Mm. They did a couple of you know I missed out on Thrashback and. There's some other bands that they had that were kind of groundbreaking bands. I, I just, I was, you know, I was already out shooting Whitney Houston and people like that, bro. I was doing live gigs for magazines, you know. I've, I've been looked at as someone who was actually like slightly older than the scene, you know. Uh, but I really aspired to it because it was, it was my interest was in that, uh, and I never ever thought of myself as being better. I always thought I was crap compared to the people I was aspiring to. I would say surround yourself with people that are better than you. Yeah, once you're the best in the room, you need to leave the room. You need to go somewhere where you're not the best anymore. Where right? you ain't gonna get any better. Yeah, so that's that's a really big deal. So it, for me, I'm always trying to find the next challenge. You know, I never thought of it, but I imagined it. You know, I started working with ID magazine. They would send me out to do stuff that was on the street level or the club level. ID and level. Face magazine were amazing. The they? face were great, but they wouldn't really. The face never ever commissioned me because they just didn't. I wasn't of that level yet. Mm. Some of my pictures ended up in the face. That was the only way I could get my pictures in magazines, you know, by getting in with the record companies. So once I started doing press shots for record companies, I bypassed trying to get a gig from the people that weren't going to give me any gigs. For some strange reason, they never ever went, oh yeah, no, because I wasn't probably trying hard enough to get in that. Because I was like, I didn't think I was good enough. But I got into the ID magazine, and that's, that was my area. Rough and ready DIY style magazine, cut and paste. That thing was the most incredible style bible ever. You know, I mean, I don't know what it is now, but back in those days, it was on dry paper. They never had a lot of money. Face had loads of backing, man. Square bound, tidy. But then people that made those magazines all come from the same area. It's a little bit like the Adidas and the Puma story. You know, two brothers. Adidas is the first brand. And the younger brothers and the older brother, they have a little bit of a spat. The young one goes, yeah, why don't we try this or something? Try that. And his bigger brother's going, shut your mouth, mate. It's, you know, come on, it's not what we're doing. He's going, no, well... I've got ideas I want to do because well, you got to just do your own thing. I goes, all right, then I can start my own brand. Nobody even knows that about the very founding of Puma and Adidas. Is it's the same family, yeah? And they worry about the eight families that are running the world, you know. And and I imagine that Nike is the opposition, you know. If you look at domination, brand domination, you know. But and I wouldn't be surprised if Nike have probably matched and outsell both of those brands. You know, that's how competitive. The world is you know and and i found that as well on 
with levels of even in editorial levels. You work for one mag, you're never going to get a job from the other mag. They're like, no, 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 you're not part of our team, you're part of that. Mm. So I was like, I tell you what, I'm going to be part of the thing that you're going to be writing stories about for the next 50 years. And everyone will want you. You, they were, I don't care if they want me, they want the pictures, it's not me, it was never about me, it's about seeing my pictures of other people. I'm, I'm not taking pictures of Norm Skin, putting them in the, the magazine, you're taking pictures of like Demon Boys, you know, Hijack, you know what I mean, MC Duke, breaking the mould, wearing the Dax on his album cover, you know what I mean, even even um, Demon Boys, when we said to them, you know, you, you know, you can get a prop for the shoot, what do you want to get? I had no idea I was going to do that shoot, you know, bro, when we were doing that shoot, we they they said we want to do a shoot up on this estate we well, never did a recce and never went there to see what it looked like what we did is we went and we picked them up in the car and then we followed their directions to go to this part a place in tottenham via the high road and it's kind via of the barber shop prove all the farm is it's, like west, it's green, a, west green road i don't know north. you're a taxi driver you know the roads. <laughs> I, I didn't even know where we were going that's how I like to work, spontaneous, mm. make it up when you get there. Yeah, and so yeah. when I saw the place, I went, rah, this is a boom location. And it took us a while because they weren't really happy with us doing the shoot on there because there'd been all that problems with bad press with, you know, the incident that had happened there a year or whatever before. And the riots and that. Yeah. yeah, and the riots and everything. So they weren't sure, who's this guy with all this camera kit? And, and the, this is what I'm trying to say to you. Their prop that they asked for, yeah, was a cosy. They asked for a white, or they didn't colour what colour, they we need a Ford Cosworth. And I was thinking, I thought you guys were going to go for like a Beamer or, you know, you know, a bad boy car or something. And they're like, no, that is a bad boy car. I went, really? Oh, it's Cosworth, man. I said, it. really? Yeah. I didn't even know who it was. Then it was all this big hoo-ha and palaver about it, which was, we needed to have it. They had to have someone who was over a certain age for the insurance, which, which none of us were old enough. So my mate, Chuck. He, he was, you know, he was older and he was a professional driver and a producer and stuff, but he assisted me that day and, and as the driver, because he had a license and so they could get the insurance, because they only hired the car, but you had to be able to say, you know, it was an RS Cosworth, bro. Exactly, RS. So, I'm thinking, like, when, when I saw the car and I went, okay, so, is that it? And they it was were a like, Sierra, bro, wasn't it? Sierra. Bro, they were like, bro, you seen this car? This is a heavy hitting car right now, and oh, it's so British, you can't get more yeah, British. Bucket, bucket, my mate had one, they had bucket seats in it. it was well, like, yeah, but then it turned oh. out it, that was the fastest car of a day, you know what I mean? Yeah, Old Bill yeah. were using them as well. Oh, it's Cosworth. And so that's where, that's where that shot will come about. But it was some brilliant moments there because it's all about representing what other people see, how they wanted to feel, you know. I was, the first shoot I did with them, I said to them, I'll, I'll take you out of your comfort zone and I'll take you somewhere near to where I am in North London because they always want to be north side because they are North London so whatever you do you know you know, start taking them too far they're like nah this don't feel comfortable it's not representing where we're coming from and I took them down up to a place in Chalk Farm and uh, onto the railway tracks and that was a brilliant moment because I was a disused railway track that I'd found just wandering around trying to find locations and uh, that was the first shoot we did down I did a shoot down there with MC Duke as well I, I had all these little location places that I that were my spots mm. And to this day, wherever I go, I'm always looking. Last night I was walking back down behind uh, Ding Dong, ding, 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 running parallel with um, Shoreditch High Street. Um, there's like some really heavy cobbled streets, really old fashioned cobbled streets. And last night I was walking down one last night and I just looked at it from a distance and I thought, it's like 1920s this is. If it was really rainy, could have someone right there. If it's three o'clock in the morning when there's no cars, no people about, I love to do stuff like that. I did a shoot for another guy. I said, like, we're going to start the shoot at 3 a.m. on a Saturday. And he went, are you mad? I goes, bro, trust me. What we do, if we start at 3 a.m., there'll be no cars on the road because everyone will be clubbing or in somewhere and then everyone's gone home. And what we do, instead of starting early, yeah, and getting an early light and then working all day till it gets a few dark ones, why don't we start in the dark Mm. get the night shots at the beginning of the shoot mm. and then when you start to get knackered and the light comes up we do some daytime shots and the shoot's done boom mm. and then what you get is you get the streets to yourself that's that's what makes you, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, what, that's what makes you uh, i'm giving away all my techniques and secrets here sleeve what's but going on you're yeah. <laughs> not supposed to be telling everyone how i get those shots how do you get that shot with no one in it <laughs> Well, but, I but just, listen, the young, the youngins or people coming up, they can learn off people like you. No, I don't you're mind. You're like one of the masters. Thank you. I don't mind sharing. I don't mind sharing it. You know, you have to excuse me. I've got like my legs aren't what they used to be. I could lie and say all that break dancing <laughs> I used to do. 
it started to pain my knee but i weren't a brake i've just fallen off my bike way too many times but yeah i mean you know i think it's important to um to talk about how you do stuff which is why we love those brainwashing moments or like kind of just talking to great people is that sharing ideas is very important you know it's inspiring and it also makes you feel good about you where your head's at and you know each, what, listen each one teach one absolutely absolutely um but yeah you know and also you already know but are you and i say one already knows what they need to do but are you prepared to do you know are you scared of yourself you know mm. i used to do i used to take artists and say look get on that wall sometimes you gotta take and they'll be like sometimes you have to take a risk. yeah but then i'd have to take the risk not, well i'd have to give them my example i'd have to say look what i mean is hold my camera for a second mm. then i clamber up onto the wall i stand on the wall and then i go like that at the top of the wall I go, if you do that as that looks to you and they go oh that looks sick i go right you do that but they weren't going to climb on the wall but you have to lead by example so i would often do things and show people what i mean and then i let them take the action some people be like you know what i'm not really sure about standing i go don't worry you're on the wall just sit down find your comfort thing yeah just find your comfort then they see the picture and they're going do you know what i wish i stood up man that picture is sick mm. but that's next time they'll do this they, 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 hopefully they'll take something from that shoot maybe they'll have more attitude when they go on the stage i've done that with nwa bro in in in, in, the, in the states they were not having a great time they're in the studio i think it wasn't long before after they'd broken up with ice cube uh they were really not they, they weren't sure about us we we're out there on a the production doing the documentary i had my camera with me and uh, the, the producer that was doing the interview I, i'm not sure if they were they were feeling it so mm. uh and as a side thing to that she had introduced uh, them to me as i was the presenter of the show i was doing the links but i was also a well-known photographer and they're like yeah whatever yeah and you know and i was like guys you know can we do you mind if i take a little shot of you together while there's, there's you know nothing going on with the camera crew and whatever and they were like oh you know you could really see they really were like i just want to get out of it so we went outside the studio and they just were the way they were which was just kind of you know f for nwa which was you know nubians with attitude i didn't think there was very much attitude really because i had the fish eye on mm. and i was like yeah guys you know if you could just give me something and they're just standing there like that and i was like and i think i even said you know i thought you guys were like you know niggas with attitude man what's going on here like and i gave the camera to uh i think i gave it to mc wren and i said hold on to that this is what i mean is and he held the camera and I'm going to lean right into the lens. And when you go into a fisheye, it gets all distorted. And around there, you put your hand in, the hand's all big and I'm all small. And I've done a couple of moves like that. Dre had a look and he goes, all right, yeah, all right. No. And so all that I got was Ren going like that. And he gave me the one finger, but that was all I needed. Because <laughs> the rest of them all were standing there like that. And it's just, it's that just- That one shot, that one shot. That's the shot. I mean, I've got some other ones and they're not terrible. No, but what I mean is that was that one that, shot. That's, you're only that's really shooting for the, yeah. for the power of one anyway, you know, and back yeah. in those days, you're talking about 35 mil film, 36 exposures. It weren't 2000 shots on a digital thing. You just go, now this is like making a painting. You get the piece of paper, you get the black pen out and you've got to draw it well. You only get 36 chances to get one really good drawing. And more often than not, you probably only get one really good just someone's eyes like half cocked very difficult yeah, to shoot you, you can't go anywhere norm until we quickly cover the dance energy yeah like, no, go for it. dance energy you know was an absolute uh wicked show you know yeah it, it come when when was the first one like 89 90? no it was 90 90 91 yeah. i think the first one how did you get on to uh become a presenter on dance energy because of my photography you know the reason why i got onto dance energy was purely because i had heard on the grapevine don't forget 1990 by that time um Bruh, it's 89, 90, because I was in New York. I was in New York in 89 because Jazzy and Soul to Soul were number one worldwide, mm. with, uh, which was big for me because, you know, they're my mates from Camden, man. You know, I had already done photographs with them guys just on the street level for their flyers, for their shop. And, uh, you know, and, you know, we had something we really knew we were all going to blow up, man. We just were grow just doing our thing. But I went out there and I remember... Um, that's yeah, so around that time there was also the talk of this new show coming they were developing that was based on dance music and stuff and i just thought wow and i remember my mate saying to me oh you should go along there because maybe you can do photographs at it and i was like you're damn right and by that time i'd already been on a couple of video shoots you know i uh, kind of a, i totally had an understanding of film and promo making but i was doing photography and you know you used to use, you get look for any excuse to be able to go and do something that would further yourself to be and i was like mate if I could take photographs of TV shows 
and or on sets that would be brilliant so when I went to this meeting to meet the, pr the production people um, I went as a, a knowledgeable person in the scene that they were about to make this program about and obviously there are other people record companies that knew of me they were, everyone was throwing all the names so some of the researchers that were working on the first series they were uh, working in record companies and they wanted to flow they go oh, I might get into TV so there's everyone was expanding into a new thing so it was all very fresh and all very 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 original and unique to be honest I was having a meeting I told the, I showed the girls my um, portfolio the producers um, Mary Calderwood and Darian Schlesinger I think they wrote the program idea um, I think they were more probably the writers but it was uh, Activate Productions that originated the concept that was going to be commissioned by BBC2 Def2 which it did mm. but when I went to this meeting and chatted with them and showed them my pictures they were like wow 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 and I was you know I, I was thinking they're looking at the pictures and I was going yeah well that's the so and so from there so I was just talking through all the pictures and and uh, you know they were like wow you're amazing and I was oh thank you no thanks no no and I was like yeah no 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 you're amazing I goes, what do you mean she goes well you just seem to know so much obviously they didn't know anything about it as much as I did they knew something was buzzing on the streets and they were they you know they're like what is this happening all these young people what's going on you know and uh, we need to get involved and they wanted to get people that were from the scene involved in the making of this TV show to represent a true face for the show and from the street yeah and in a sense um, and that was that was all me and you know in a sense when they s said to me oh have you ever thought about being on TV I remember saying nah because I hadn't thought about it I was like no I just, no she didn't say that she said have you ever thought about being on the other side of the camera and I went, no, nah, not really, you know, I'm quite happy, you know, I've never really, no, nah, not really, what, what do you mean? And I was actually taken aback, what do you mean on the other side of the camera? Like, I thought I was here to try and get shoot pictures, stills, maybe I could do stills of the artists and stuff, you know, that's where my head was at. I mean, I've only done go sees to go and get photography work, and go to a job and suddenly you go, oh, I'm, I'm just turning into a driver, to decide, that's not why I said, I was a bit shocked when she said, you would be really good. And then, I, then that, that switched on my, well, I used to be a drummer in a band. And they were like, really? Because, yeah, I used to be the sort of backbone to the band, you know, and I play drums, so I love music. And so a completely different personality and character was being drawn out of me that day. And then by the end of it, what we decided was well, maybe we could incorporate your photography into the show somehow. And I got excited. I went, yeah. Mm. But she said, but what we think is that we're going to be running some screen tests um and we think you should come along because they were trying to do something different they were trying to come up with something that had a different angle so they wanted to have people that were presenting the show that knew what they were talking about not someone who's a great presenter has got to spend three weeks doing research so they when they talk to whoever they've got as a guest they know what they're talking about which is was the way of the world up till then this was the beginning of when they're actually using the people from a scene to actually talk about their own scene and that's one of the reasons why to this day i think dance energy is that kind of cult hero show because people really sat at home when they saw themselves on telly you saw someone you knew you saw someone who looked like you that music that we had across the board was stuff that you liked it wasn't you never got the music that we had on any other show it was Not underground all, wasn't it it was underground oh yeah well yeah and it was dance music it wasn't and underground dance. Well, it was more than that. It was more than underground. Because because the it, thing we is, had, it, wasn't, we, it wasn't just hip hop, was it? it was no, it was like dance, dance music, music under dance umbrella yeah. of dance music, soul, yeah. rave, hip hop, anything. Then it was street style. It was mm. small DIY. You know, it was club scenes around the world, and we get little reports by people. I went flying all over the world, bro. We had no money to do that show. And the thing is, you think about it, you had like 40 minutes, so you had to break that down into a 40 minute show. So you had like a music new, is it, was it, was it like a music It was 30 show? minutes, but thanks for thinking it was 40. Was it 30? Yeah, and like, it was 28 yeah. minutes, including the uh, <laughs> uh, excluding the title sequence. So yeah, it was crammed. That's why it was fast cutting, chop, chop, chop. But but it was all about the music. But you had Absolutely. like music, musical news yeah. on it. You had dancing. You used yeah. to go out on, on, that on was, site. Yeah, you know, like yeah. talk about fashion as yeah, well. Yeah, street style. Yeah. It was the whole package. It, it basically was, was package. a it basically was a program that represented you know dance music culture, which is more than just the music, as you just said. It is the whole package. You know, it's the way people are. It's where people live. It's you know giving identity to people that are in sort of small towns. You know, you know in the Midlands or where you up in up north all these places got a representation in some way or another if they had something going on that was like Affleck's Palace in Manchester it was the coolest place to go and get your cool, cool clobber from Dingwall's Market down in Camden so we had things about markets and you had stories from LA you know about the skaters 
out in LA, you know. So we got a local LA kid to do a little film. You yeah, know, was everything was very DIY, and we all patch it together every week, weekly program, bam, bam, bam. We need to bring that back. You know, a, pr well, a series like that would be amazing nowadays. Yeah, well, people keep saying that to me. We need to bring it back, and I'm like, no. Whoever nowadays are, they need to do something that truly represents them, and they yeah. do. You just got to go on YouTube and search it out on some weird channel. The difference between what's going on now and what we had is that we only had four channel outlets exactly on television yeah. and everybody watched television re television religiously like it was three to four you know, to five didn't all it? That, now people now all they do is they don't watch telly then they sit there for three days and watch a box set that's not normal you don't have no conversation with people it's not a social thing anymore you know oh i'll watch it when i want even when you used to go to the cinema <coughs> you go to the cinema it was a night out You'd go there and you'd sit there and you'd watch the whole film. You would hold your wee if you wanted. If it was a bad boy film, you couldn't even go to it. <laughs> now everyone's like, ah, oh, no, I'm just going to watch it on um, whatever net shits. You know, and I pause every five minutes, I adverts every 10 seconds. No, there's no momentum, you know, and that was a beautiful thing about then. It's a new record came out last week. Boom, it was on our show. It's it in the there. Dance that Energy charts, you know, the buzz charts and all yeah. this sort of stuff, which is an adaptation of magazines at the time. Weekly magazines continually representing the scenes that were happening and that was a beautiful thing so i was very fortunate to come back from a trip in new york with soul to soul guys um kind of rushed back actually because i remembered i had this date to go and do this uh this um casting thing for this new tv program idea but straight off of the back of new york i'll be honest with you i had the haircut which i had the funky dreads where did you get your haircut like the flat top with the with the uh, tram line did you have like uh, Elvis? I had a uh, hairdresser called Elvis, who was a renowned hairdresser from North Wheezy. You look wicked, mate. Yeah, where, he, where, he, where he, he, he would. Your arms from as well. Ah, oh, it's all over the place, mate. Yeah, yeah, I, it's really possible for me to remember, but most of it was my own stuff or people throwing stuff at me. Uh, I used to get a few bits like the click suits I got down from um, Four Star General. Used to get stuff from Four Star. From General George. Yeah, yeah I used to get yeah. a few bits from him. Um, I was getting stuff from him before TV. Well, I'm just trying to remind people, yeah, that I, we made TV. TV didn't make we. Mm. Yeah, we were doing our thing. TV's five years late. There were shows before me. There was Ensign Radio and there was uh, Behind the Beat. They had other people producing them. Interesting enough, I was in an interview the other day and I nearly crushed the guy because it was like he was being... He was using his track record because there were so few far between. Like There was not much in our area, so... He said, oh, yeah, you know, behind the beat, the, the producer's name. And I said, well, yeah, but he could, did lay the premises, but that wasn't what my thing. My thing wasn't, I didn't work with him directly, but he was definitely on the inside because we had a few people. We had to have people on the inside going, listen, you need to do a program about this scene. Up until then, they were like, no, why are we going to put these kind of kids on TV? And trust me, when our studio was on, you used to go, whoa. There's nothing else on British TV you ever seen a pack of black and white kids all together it dancing. Was on fire. Happy as Larry, it was on, fire. on fire. And Never. And top also, of the Pops was the closest and no one could yeah. dance on Top of the Pops. And also, you think about it, Norm, like, as you said, people were, it weren't just like London dancing. No, we, 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 we had people case. busting people down from up north. How did you get them Because dances? they would go, to, the researchers would go to clubs. Audition. No, these are real people. So they they basically pull them out the club. They like, go to a club and they say wow. they went to clubs and then they found the great. Well, they went up north to Hacienda, I think. One time I think they went up Hacienda and the Manchester lot were sick, and they were like, "Oh, you lot, do you want to come down? And we're looking for audiences." Then they would do how a thing. You, how would you get them down on a coach? I don't know. I didn't produce the charges. I don't know. From there, <laughs> probably yeah, no coach. No, I don't think so. It would be a minivan, bro. Minivan. Yeah, the yeah. coach. Minivan. <laughs> minivan at the a most, bad coach yeah. or trains. But they would get them down <laughs> to be part of this <laughs> national show. Obviously, that's again why the show is so powerful because it truly represented the nation mm. at, together. And then yeah. there was a, and then a realization for people to go, oh, you got people up north that are into the same thing as we're into down in the south. And so we brought the country together, mm. you know, and that's where you're right to say there should be something that you, united one. But it's a different mm. generation now and they're on online, mm. you know, um, anyone can be online. We need but, to bring but it can you get, but can you get a major, I'll tell you who, who's got it, Big Nasty, He's in a position. He got it going on. He got a, you know, he's got a full-on show series. It has all the acts and artists that deserve the re respect. He has guests, comedians, and he, he keeps it on a real one. It's a little bit like a Jonathan Ross type of sort of show, um, but it's and it's also in that same sort of slot. There's nothing wrong with that because that's representing today. So all these new kids, they're like, that's my show. 
you know, our show was dance energy, you know, and that, so, that was that was a long a... time ago now, but it, it will always live forever because it was the first of that, that sort of style of show that was really working with across. I'll tell you what else was really important as well, Normski, was um, was the camera angle shot on the dancers and, yeah. and, and, and the acts. Like, the, the, the people behind the cameras were, like, wicked. They, like, the, the direction, angle. the direction. From, zooming in on a pair of trainers. Yeah, the direction like from the executive producer was, I said it the other day on Raid, and I'll say it's for you because you deserve it, and you just hit the uh, nail on the head, was that she, I remember saying, I don't want any shit camera work. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want any shit camera words. I don't want any upskirt shots. I don't want to see all the detail. That's why we always had a bright studio. This is not about anything except seeing the greatness of all these young people, mm -hmm. how they dress, the differences, and get close up. And and if you weren't a good dancer, get out of the fucking studio. That was it. <laughs> You're not sorry, mate. You can't come on dance engine and stand still. So we, that's where that character that the real McCoy did. Uh, can't stand still ski and they did a parody of me because I was always that action patch no, but that really is quite a funny thing ironically is that you know dance music isn't made to stand still some well, I go to clubs sometimes yeah and I'm like why are you here why are you all you people here I know I might sound a bit mean but sometimes I'm standing there thinking why are you lot you've lot been at the bar on why don't and you know I see people at gigs not even watching the band why are you in here you're using checking, up. checking their phones and all Go that. home! Yeah. If you're, and then you've got next one. Yeah, you, you know that beat, you hear that beat there. Yeah, do you know, but you know that rhyme is bitten for bruv. I'm listening to a record and dance. I mean, I need no encyclopedia dissection right now, yeah? <laughs> but some people, they like, I'm like, bruv, if you want to have a little nanny meeting about something, yeah, let's go and find a sofa after the club's finished. But that's a funny way of going out. Back in the day, when you went out, you raved your ass off. You didn't stop, did you? Don't stop dancing, mm -hmm. dancing, man, who dancing at home. Had such a yeah, good time, yeah. can't stop. Graffiti artists are like, yeah, I'm, I'm inspired now. I've got to bomb something. <laughs> now the graffiti <laughs> artists are getting permission to do like illustrations and getting paid money for using it as advertising. Talking I about don't mind all that. The professional graffiti artists, but trust me, I do love a bomber. He's breaking all the rules, ten foot or whatever. He's gone upside so down on the place. And all them gone like, yeah. crazy. Fume, I love that. Edgy, yeah. edgy. It's Which is very much what Dance Energy was like. We were taking a lot of risks on television. First TV show I know that had split screen. You know, me talking something there, talking about the chart there, and then we had the ticker tape information running there, and the line going the other way. And uh, you know, uh, mo 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 it was ridiculous. You know, um, uh, about the amount of information. Plus, you had sound. The amount of information we were doing some mad things on TV. Um, but yeah, I remember also <coughs> producers saying, I don't want my show, to, any of my shows to look two dimensional. We're going to make the flat TV look like a three dimensional. So we're getting interesting shots, you know, really, and active stuff, you know, and with some great directors, uh, some great producers I'll tell you that all thing, had great ideas. I'll tell you another thing that made the show as well, uh, Norm, was the, um, the artwork on the walls. I mean, it reminded me a lot. Do you know what? I remember her name the other day. When I was trying yeah, to remember, I can't artwork. remember. I think her name was Georgia Ward. It's all beautiful pastel colours. She and... was brilliant in her yeah, art amazing. department. And also, it was like pop art as well. It was, it like, was like pop, pop art, yeah. yeah like so, and things style. were really big and really... And it was kind of simple, but it had an identity. That worked. You know, um, and that, and you know, I mean, God, you know what? You wouldn't believe this the other day at my book launch <laughs> at the Photographer's Gallery. This guy came along and I met him before and I was like, oh, I can't believe it. And he went like that and he had a DE Dance Energy fucking wow. studio t-shirt on wow. still got it 34 le years later 33 years later did you sign it? I didn't sign it because I he didn't want me to sign it I didn't he didn't ask me to sign it yeah. I, and I saw it again maybe I did sign it maybe he's got another one but he came to the um, launch again um, for the book launch recently this was last year I first saw him at some gig and he'd come along and he goes yeah do you remember me and I was like oh, kind of and I remember he goes yeah I remember we and I went, oh my God, and he just like, like that. He went like that, and he had one layer and another layer. And I went, oh my God. And I stopped the whole room. I went, oh yeah, get everyone, yeah, to the skis up. <laughs> he was actually at the Dance Energy Studio, and he's got a t-shirt. Then he pulled, he goes, yeah, I brought this along as well. And he pulled along the double cassette album of the Dance Energy wow. cassette. He still got it unplayed, wow. brand new, wow. proper fan. Then he pulled out something else. And I was like, oh. How like he, must it must have been so important to him that time of his life for him to keep I love it when people pull out stuff that they I've got one and two things that I've had since 19 God knows when 
it's should be done. Minute. But guess what? Things were made differently then because when I saw that t-shirt, I was like, bruv, have you, have you, have you been keeping in the box or something? Because I've worn this thousands of times. They just don't make them like that t-shirts we use. I'm like, you're right. Everything's made to just fall apart after three or four washes. Yeah, also yeah. consumer. You know, that's what I like about old school, if you want to call it that. You know, my Olympus here is made of brass. It's a mechanical camera. The only thing electric in it is the light meter. But the rest of it is mechanical, like a Swiss watch. Wow. It don't depend on batteries. Wow. Yeah, it can work without batteries. And that, that that's a madness. And then and I dropped it, it's been underwater, and it's like never. I still got it at home, bro. I got that camera like 1986, 87, 86 or 87 or something. I got that camera, I still got them. I lost bullet, one. Bullet, bullet proof. But they were made to last. Yeah. Made to last. You know, some mm. of the lenses are a little bit scratched, a bit guffed, fair enough. You can actually have them all taken apart, repolished and clean. Zoeco lenses go for a, a shed load of money now because, you know, they were made of glass. Mm. <laughs> Everything now is made of plastic. Yeah. You know, it's, it's which actually, you know, you, you don't get plastic diamonds, do you? You know, diamond is a, a special piece of stone. Yeah, and that's what, you know, your equipment should be special. Going back to uh, dance energy. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, like, um, Va you know, Vass Blackwood, uh, he turned Vass. up a little bit. And I mean, yeah. you know, Vass, Vass is, was another powerful form of energy. You know, big, yeah. big up Vass, you know, what, what's yeah. he got? I'm trying to get him in the cab. Um, so I've been in contact with Vass, but, you know, he also brought a lot a lot of that energy. Yeah, well. what, we were going, what we were doing was we were mimicking sitcoms. Mm. So we made a new musical form of sitcom where we had it. it did, we didn't want to have a show that was just like uh, Top of the Pops, that was just stage performances. Um, we wanted to come up with something unique and they come up with a thing. This is why it went from Dance Energy to House Party. And that's when Vass got involved in it, mm. when we changed the format. Because Dance Energy was a dance program that was like free live for acts in the studio. And then some mag it was a magazine format show. So we'd have like a little bit of information, a little news report something happening in another country in a little chart bam half an hour's gone bro that's it then we got into house party where it was a concept was to do it like a sitcom where a music sitcom where what we'd do is we'd have the performers perform in the house like we're at a house party mm. so we'd do a set that looked like a kitchen or we'd do a set that looked like a bar a bedroom or we have the hallway and the stairs the funny stairs that never went anywhere <laughs> and then when the act went up to the top of the stairs that would turn around and come back down because there was no end you know yeah, yeah. um and they gave it a feeling of, you know, what it ran with, Paolo, which was Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, which was mm. a full-on sitcom, which had its own way of using music in its clever way, but it was all about the culture and, you know, we had the same thing, but we could specify and go in and just make it the most creative three, that was where the three dimensions come. And also, we brought an element of acting to it, so we used to encourage the artists to take part in little skits. Everyone loves a sketch of an artist, and now every kind of TV show is attempted to do these sort of things. And then having Zach as a sidekick to me meant I had a co-presenter so that I had someone to bounce off so that I could deliver my things uh, which would be regards to what's coming up next or whatever but then we'd have this kind of banter so you're having a laugh at your mate's house and that's what people would sit at home thinking oh this is brilliant man this is like and these guys are cracking me up I mean you know, I'll be rocking now I'd be the cooler one and Vassal play himself down and be like oh, but actually Vassal's really the coolest one and we had a lot of laughs and did a lot of work together and you know and, and I mean, he, two, he was brought in specifically yeah i mean i i used to love working with us because we used to do something that we never used to do with dance energy was is that we used to go to bbc um north acton mm. and, and they just basically had an office there and uh, we used to go there and we used to rehearse the, the, the scenes we'd block the scenes that we were going to do and the gags that we'd, we'd we'd do which were all relevant to what was you know the 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 um script of the show who was going to be on it uh, but we just take we tongue-in-cheek and have a laugh of it you know i did a sketch with well i we vass and myself did a sketch with kylie minogue you know kylie minogue was a dance queen but you know she we took her off the top of the parts and put her into dance and you gave her some proper cred back do you know what i mean and um and why not you know she had a massive hit on that all the clubbers were playing all the gay crowd loved her and everything so why not but what she was brilliant was where we said, oh, we're going to do a little sketch. And, you know, obviously she's done Neighbours. So she's done a little bit of sitcom acting. So we did a funny thing. We were pretending to do karate or kung fu <laughs> for a laugh. You know what I mean? And she's trying to teach us and Vass can't get it together. And I'm like, ah. It was a laugh. <laughs> TLC, they come. We had a thing where they, I wouldn't let them in the house. Was at the front door, welcome everyone to come in. Yeah, you're not coming into the show. Who are you guys? I go, what? Who are you guys? You can't come in here. And then they started with Vass. And Vass was like, I'll get you in the house, I'll get in the house. And I never know, these scenes will cut. So after you see it, afterwards, you're like, ah. Oh. And then, you know, they get in the house and then they bust out and do their song. 
and that's us. We, we, we gave we gave some hum, a human side to these epic acts mm. so, to bring them onto out on a level where people could see them as people, not just as superstars. Um, and that's what kind of rubbed off of me and made me look better than I really was. Is that we're all on the same level in the house, you know? They were a game for a laugh, you know. Um, we 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 were having a laugh. Uh, the record company loved it because it was original. It was a different way of seeing their eyes. The audience thought this is just brilliant. This is absolutely brilliant. When you never even heard the act talk, you ever watch their other shows, you never even hear them talk. They just come up doing this song, go away. And people want to hear. Look at the world now. You know, everyone's just constantly putting their life story up on the socials all the time, making their posts more human, and then putting the flyer after the picture of them at home. Do you know what I mean? This is because people engage with that reality. And I think that's what we kind of had. We had this kind of feeling of, mate, that could be my mate's house. You know? it was such, yeah, it was such a such a great show. And, you know, so you had so many yeah. legendary acts. I mean, you had like Third Bass was on there. Yeah. And, you know, and it was so, so many acts that were like, you know, it, 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 was, it was a fantastic show. Do you know, I forgot we had Third Bass on there in the early series. You're absolutely right. And we had the Karis one, Run DMC, mm. Moni Love, Hijack. Oh, man. There's loads of them, Jazzy, Soul Soul, Karen Wheeler. Oh my God! Well, like, first TV show that the uh, Prodigy ever did. Wow. They didn't even want to. They didn't want to be on top of the box. They actually said, "Nah, it's not for us. We're not doing that." But Dance Energy pops along, and they're like, "Oh, we, we, we'll do that." So you know, we had a lot of cr crazy stuff um, that was unique to our scene. Hundred percent. Um, I can't remember all the acts that were on it. We had Pet Shop Boys. I remember Pet Shop Boys. I got a great shot in the book actually when we did Run DMC. Run DMC we're on the show and we used to do two studios uh, I say two shows in one studio so in a studio session one day shoot mm. we would shoot six acts throughout the day three before lunch and then three after lunch um, you know so, and we'd mix the audience up so you know you didn't see the same people twice if you did see the same people twice we'd, they'd change outfit the really good dancers would change outfit and we'd push them at the back and put the other ones in the front it was a very, very low budget TV program, and that's probably another reason why it was so brilliant. Way too much money spunked on loads of stuff, and you can't see the goodness of it, it's all covered in crap. And what we had was not enough money, so we had to DIY I mean, George was in there painting that stuff, making those set things, sticking them on the wall. Really? Yeah, she's in there with like high, high, high fluorescent paint and polystyrene. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, they not like the word, when the word had it, the word had money. <laughs> so you see their stuff, their stuff's been molded, solid, properly made. You know what I mean? Uh, and it, and it looked like it and it, you know it was another great our stuff was like kind of just like really DIY and I think it gave it a real sense but it of it gave it an edge you yeah, know yeah and it, it also it made, it made it feel like you felt like oh, actually I'm not imposed by what I'm looking at yeah? it was all very much you could be a part of this this is an in you know you get an interactive show and then people would be like going I want to be on it how do I get on it and then we had the other thing which was lift off mm. which was actually when I first wrote the concept for Lift Off, I called it Let Off! Because <laughs> I was in Jamaica on a trip one time. I had to come, if you've got any ideas, think of ideas and what we could do with the show. And everyone was contributing ideas. And we were always going to have this idea of where you could uh, help new up and coming bands. How could we do it? So we come up with this idea, which was basically Lift Off, where you send in your homemade videos. Mm. And people you know, literally were talking VHS way before now. Man, do a homemade video now. It looked like 16 millimeter on the iPhone. You get me? Back then, it was on VHS, Probably gritty. Super 8, Cinefilm, gritty as hell, yeah. And, and, you know, and really sweet that people would go out. Now it's mental what people can do with TikTok and all this video making, but that was a great thing because the prize was, was the best video voted for by the public. So, you'd, you know, you, you'd get through, you'd get through, you'd get through, then you get to semi-finals, and whoever won, won a record deal and a single and a photo shoot with a professional photographer and, and a photo and a video made of that single a professional director you know what i mean and that we i think we've got two successful runs on that with that concept and a couple of acts got a little chance to get to get their foot in the industry so it was very much a program for the people about the people you know back in around kind of 85 86 87 88 89 you know house music started to uh kind of really develop especially mm. you know but like because with hip-hop it was kind of like um you know you had like the kind of gangster element of it and all that where with house music you was hearing really kind of uplifting the yes, music right. mm. that would kind of unite everybody That's right. uh, on the dance floor because yeah, the gangster stuff didn't come to the 90s anyway 
Did you get into the? Uh, did you get into like the house music? Uh, um, not really. Not really. I wasn't really. You know, I, bro. I was into real music and I was into hip hop. Mm. When I say real music, I was into live gigs and live bands. So around about that, those sort of years, you know, house music is an interesting thing because you know you have US house, the gospel house. That's the first house I had. And yeah, I did like it, you know, but that went way too later. I was into that music in the eighties. House music? What are you talking about? You know, mm. um, Chicago house. I heard of it. I knew of it, but I was engrossed into hip hop. The house wasn't from here. The guys that were into the house music were like the people like Paul Trouble Anderson, passed as well, rest oh, in peace. Yeah. The big, big, the big, big, the boogie, all them big boogie DJs that are really the first people to bring black American music into the UK. Um, they were way older than me, they were older than me. So to me, I was like, I wasn't even, that wasn't my thing <coughs> for a while. <coughs> then I did get into it eventually, but most of that block from between 1985 to say like 1990, I spent most of that predominantly taking photographs and running around within the hip-hop mm. uh, scene that eventually expanded into jungle drum and bass uh house was definitely around i wasn't going to Donny donnington and all those rays you weren't going to the rays no that spectrum land of nah. i know loads of people love all of that I, where i was coming from i was like nah why do i want to go and, go and get mashed up what's that all about i didn't understand that but you know i did go to heaven i did go to a couple of those mad you know acid house parties you know and uh i met people like you know mr c you know richard west uh, yeah, we got mr. C. and and you know and there are some great djs that were again slightly ahead of me with regards to being i want a dj bro let's get that straight yeah the reason why i love djing is because as a musician that could have regarded himself as a frustrated musician what i find beautiful about playing music is I feel like an instrumentalist. Mm. I feel like I'm actually indulging in what I love. Now I prefer to play records and I play a lot of house and I do play a lot of underground house. Um, but I do remember and I've got an epic soulful house collection and I got right into it. But that was not in the 80s, bro. That was like uh, by 1994, 95, I still weren't going to house raves. I was in the jungle now. Oh. Yeah, straight out of the back of hip hop taking those breaks stretching them mm. time stretching you know speeding them up two-step break beat there's no house in that whatsoever i mean really start to stand strong about that those weren't my scenes back in those days you know they were happening it was all running parallel mm. and you can't really do everything you can't be into everything well you can do but I, I didn't need to i had enough going on i was very happy uh when the gangster rap kicked in that's when I got more into house because mm, yeah. I'm not into this gangster thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm you're not, more into, not, you, you, not into all of this. I'm a give my fucking I'm gonna kill you. No, that's not how I was brought up. I'm not into it. Mm. That's when I stopped listening to hip hop. When it started to get really aggy. Really gangster. Uh, yeah. I, I once again went for the R&B hip hop with the pop hit songs that were much more lovely and uplifting because that is where I'm coming from. Mm. I'm a nice, positive, uplifting kind of guy. I'm not saying I'm a, you know, I'm not aware of the badness that's going on in the world, but I'm not about to promote it. Yeah, I'm not from an era that has got a shout about how hard it is. I respect the people that do that, but that doesn't make me feel good. Yeah. Why well, do I listen to them tunes? I'm a prank your ass. I'm a what? That one. I'm a guy in No, 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 no. That's not me, man. No, I'm more uplifting than that. And one of the things I used to love about drum and bass as well was it was really jungle, mm. you know, and it had a very strong reggae element about it. And a lot of bass yeah. you know i'm a man who used to go down carnival you know uh i think when i went carnival i realized how much i like sound system and i like music that comes out of big systems and that's again another draw towards the house thing because when you've got good quality nice positive lifting house it's like being at a football match mm. everyone mm, 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 mm. it's really uplifting isn't it everyone's mm, mm, mm. i'm not into this no no that ain't dancing bruv you know find a groove but that is a new form of dancing though but I come from a place that already had some fluidity and I do like it when I, you know, went to a party the other day and I was like watching these older guys like, you know, into their 60s that have been dancing all their life, doing pro proper dancing, you know, get on the floor like they're going to do break dance moves. It's a wonderful thing, dancers, you're just expressing the music. Um, and so I've got nothing against any form of dance music, house, drum and bass, jungle, trap, trip hop, grime, whatever you want to call it. 
so long as it's got a positive message and it's good I love it but if it's got a negative message it's scary I might like that but that's not the kind of thing I'll continue to batter my brains with I'll try, try and mix positive. it up then also you've got user friendly I've been a DJ for a long time you go and start playing that battery music fight on the dance floor within a second mm -hmm. you put on some lovey tunes everyone's like in snogging but, you know simple things vibration and energy is what you put into the scene and you know you know, I see some rough lyrics done really well. Like, so you wouldn't think they were rough because it's a beautifully produced song. I can work with that, you know, um, but I can also work with disraps, you know what I mean? Because I get that. How the fuck you up? It's like saying, oh, your mum's as big as a beer and blah, 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 that kind of joke. I get that. But, you know, I've got my what I like, everyone's got their own taste, you know what I mean? So the house thing, though, I've really warmed to over the years, much more and more, because I, that energy you get. I love it, you know, and again, it reminds me of like steppers, you know, rockers, reggae music. I'm not going to keep doing this, but everything you know, everything goes back to black music, yeah. But you know, when you used to listen to, I used to listen to dub, heavy science, scientists, proper dub music. Me and my mates just sit there, you know, we'd be listening to reggae music all day long, old school dub selection, shaka, you name it, and it's the warrior tribe and all that warrior tribe, do do do, black uhuru. Right, them kind of tunes there, right? Yeah. And you got them, them, dum dum, ba, dum 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 dum, boom. But then I can put dum dum, stats to this house. Yeah, and that thing yeah. come after my dub, yeah. So music is music. You're just giving it a name because you're swaying in a particular way. But it's ultimately it's all about beats and melody, isn't it? Mm, oh, without a shadow. You know, of that. so uh, and without it's a very beautiful that. thing when you get into the clever thing of mixing it up. Mm. So then you had, you remember you had hip house. That yeah. was when I like house music. I'll house you when you're in my hut. We it's turn it's shit it's up. It. That's flipping Jungle Brothers. Yeah, That's right. one of the reasons why I like house music because we had some really good hip house stuff. Hip house was when they got rappers to rap over house grooves. That's how I discovered house. Hip house you know, yeah, now, yeah, now, yeah, I loved all of that. And there's a lot of stuff, you know, um, Special Ed and stuff like that. Mm. That was some great, some just some great songs. You can listen to an album and you go, hang on a second, that's actually a house track. It's a hip house thing. That was always working because you had a voice telling you a story. I'd say that's how I was getting into house yeah. music as well, yeah. was hip house. Yeah, I would say yeah. that's how I got into like, it. Late, yeah, late 80s. And I liked that. And then I found that it had a whole world of its own Yeah. that, left everything behind mm. now you go into a house groove into a proper house vibes and you and you pick up that mic and start rapping over the tracks everyone's gonna go mate it's not hip-hop <laughs> you're not rap so there's a place that's what i was saying to you earlier on about you know some mcs are amazing because they just touch the mic for a second or two a second or two man i'm gonna come that through how you feeling love it but then you get next right and then the man's gonna stop it when the man the man's gonna stop it all right bro have a tea break the man <laughs> You know, but nah, so there's too much, it's like overplaying, we used to call it, like, sometimes when I was in the band, you know, you get one or two guys who are really good at guitar, Yeah. and they'd go into a lead solo, and the band would be sitting there thinking, like, it's six minutes you've been playing the solo for, bruv, like, you can stop now, you know what I mean, and it's like that madness, you know, I'm going to do a drum solo, and if I go into a drum solo, everyone's like, I'm up and finish, but it's just thing is just how far you go, how much is too much, and what is not enough kind of thing, you know? Well, I'll tell you what, Norm, because I know, look, you're burning up in the back, and I know you've got... Stuff! Listen, listen you're in the ultra oh. cab, so you're going to be burning up, but, like, I know you've got to do a couple of more interviews. Oh, so mate, you like, well... Let, I'll tell you, let's get straight it's into It's all the about book. that, bro. It's all the man with the golden shirt. It's just dropped now, you know. Um, it's a beast. Look at it. How many pages? It's 272 pages. And the quality. Look at the quality. The quality of the... The quality of the... the, the I am... I've got to thank ACC Art Books, first of all, because I had a meeting with these publishers uh, a couple of years ago now about creating a book of some of my work. And I met this the, the, the main man, John Smith, and I really liked him. He listened. And looks at my photographs. I remember I showed him another little miniature, port, miniature, a little portfolio which is quite thick of loads of work. And uh, I've often done that. I can check a person to see how, how interested they are by the speed that they turn pages. And some people go, oh yeah man, nice. Yeah, oh wow, yeah, I like this. I'm like, stop, give me my book back. Give me my book back now. Why? I go, no, that's not how you look at a book. I don't mind you going from the back and going, oh nice. Oh yeah, okay. Oh, okay. Right, okay, there's a lot it's of... When they speed... No, nah, but it. my guy, James, when he when he looked at my book, he went... And I was talking, and he was like, okay. He spent time looking at my work. And he took his time, playing the page, and I thought, mate, 
Well, when I get the book, I'm going to go into detail on like, the that's location, right. the angles of the photograph. Well, that's like, right. That, I mean, uh, you know, I'm not going to try and show your wonderful views at all now, but you know, that's where we're at. You know, there's a bit of everything in there. The UK, there's third base there, opposite the um, what are they called again? These guys. Oh yeah, Black Radical Mark II UK. I'll try to speak it up, Cypress Hill. There's the hijack, classic hijack shot. Yeah, that's our Brixton, beyond Brixton Academy. Yes, beyond Brixton Academy, yeah. Mm. And that's the, the the real deep dark one of them, uh, around right. the corner in Vauxhall. Yeah, I've got a lot of stuff, you know, X Clan out in uh, New York. That's that shot, Big Daddy Kane on the tour. But the mad thing I was going to say about that was, is that was one of the craziest experiences shooting um, Big Daddy, the, the cold chilling tour, because I was invited onto the tour bus to go to a gig. I couldn't believe it when they all fell asleep because they had jet lag. <laughs> there I am, one of the biggest rappers in the world at the moment. And they're having a little sleep. They're all sleezing. So I'm sat on this tour bus feeling a bit weird. I'm in this conceit thinking, is it weird taking a picture of someone while they're sleeping? Oh, well, might as well. Click. And then they woke up and got ready to do a gig and a few more. But the most interesting shot, what I've tried to do in this book is I've really tried to present a set of photographs of people in their kind of naive heyday when they were just coming up. Great shot of Goldie's, classic shot of him anyway, where, you know, Goldie says, in the quote that they put in the front here, the difference between Normski's photograph of me and any other is that it captures my soul. Mm. You know, when you read the whole thing which you'll do in the book, he quotes other photographers. And actually, they took, no, he's dead, they put him in. Yeah, in the heyday, listen to this, I don't write much about photography and I've never really been a fan of pictures taken over the years in terms of going to a photographer in my heyday and getting courted as you do by Bailey, Rankin, Knight, etc. David Bailey, Rankin and Nick Knight, probably the three in contemporary times biggest British photography names in the world. Goldie has he, uh, has, uh, he, he's, he he's, he's, he's gone and said, I've done them all, he says, pretty much, but this moving portrait, as I like to call it, sums up everything to me yeah he tells me that photograph is better than any shot that Rankin's taken of him Bailey's taken of him or Nick Knight it's not that it's better it's the favorite for him because those shots are all pre-medded and they look amazing but this is him in Metalheads just as he's getting an award for his record that's turned gold with all his mates and I'm in there with, we're all in there having a laugh I've banged that one out on the Olympus Mui that one that ain't even a little that was I used to shoot a lot of shots on me Mui 35 mil um, slidey front click point and shoot camera and you know that you, you know I used to do a lot of stuff like not take pictures because no one wanted pictures taken you know I, I exposed a little bit of the underground scene by taking pictures normally no one was allowed to take pictures in there bro you can't take pictures in there you know who are you you wouldn't even get into a club if you weren't the right person that's how, how deep that thing goes and so it's really beautiful to have an opportunity to share that and then for them to go do you know what i'm really glad you did that because actually that's the kind of shot that all them big name dj photographers wouldn't have gotten because they wouldn't come to the club they might have gone to club raving but not certainly not to capture it as a photographer then they go oh well let's do a shoot sometime i did other shoots with goldie as well you know oh there's another great shot of um what's his face oh there's the run dmc shot from the studio that was from darts energy so that wow. to, to continue what happened was is when I did get the presenter job on Dance Energy, it slipped away eventually because they really turned me more into a TV presenter. But um, in the title sequence at the beginning of the show, the first time you ever see me on TV, you see me with my Olympus looking at the camera and then I turn the camera and it whips, pans and goes into these dances. The first time you ever see me on television, I'm a photographer. So I used to say I'm a photographic presenter. Mm. And that's why I always presented myself as I was a, f a photographer who was presenting music to you. I already was doing that, but in magazines and stuff. And now I'm moving pictures on television. Mm. And, uh, it looks like done. an incredible book. I can't wait. There's to a it. you will. There's another shot you can't see it quite down here, which is actually when Pet Shop Boys met Run DMC on Dance Energy Studio floor. Wow! And it's a brilliant moment. Because, but the thing is, look, look, look with that, you know, with your with your new book, Ernorm, it's not just about the pictures because you've also got stories. I've got a few pictures. short stories, and I've got some wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> I've got some really brilliant testimonials. 
Mm. You know, I've got a brilliant forward written by Marcus Golden Barnes, a great writer. He wrote beautiful. I've got Andy Cowan, who was the editor for I don't know how many years at Hip Hop Connection, who actually says in his testimony, it was I who made his career as if, because I was a staff photographer for Hip Hop Connection for a very long time, I had my little section, and I was a regular photographer, I should say. And he wrote a beautiful thing, laying down the rules, Andy Cowan. Then he also had another crazy chick, Tracy Kowalik, brilliant, brilliant writer, who interviewed me years ago for, I think, Facts magazine when we first met. And the, the great piece about hip hop for them then. And I said to her, do you know what, will you write a little testimonial for me? And she went mad, they all went mad. I, I was like, some people were sensible, I've like, got artists to say a few things, you know. Goldie wrote a life thing. Got Hayes, Sean Stuzzy's written something, you know what I mean? I got them to write stuff. And some people were like, bro, I can't just do two paragraphs, I've got to do like four pages. I had to edit down another one from Torch in Germany, 360 degrees records. I had to edit him down, he said he didn't mind, but he sent me four pages of writing. Wow. I said, bro, I can't afford six pages mm. to your story about our meeting and everything. But it's such a brilliant story. So we, our brilliant editor, um, Andrew Whitaker at the ACC, he's a brilliant editor. And I said to him, we got, I don't want to chop this to pieces, but you know, and I had to do that to myself, bro. I had to be brutal mm -hmm. on what pictures I could not put in that book. It's a, beast, it's a beast, it's a beast of a beast. book. And Look I think the size of it. I'm hoping that people receive that the fact that it's not about what is or what isn't in it, it's just about how it's presented, you know, how I've gone around it, putting the Polaroids in, stuff like that, you know what I mean? It's beautiful. Uh, and the thing my is, art printing that I was doing in the dark room. These are actual prints that I actually printed myself. Wow. So I've scanned the original prints. Wow. That's an original print that we've got. Who's that? Who's that? Purvis? Purvis, Purvis. bro. That's a break. Put, yeah. yeah, I had to lift a break. I had to put him in there. Yeah. I got a lot of stuff from the UK boys in the beginning of my early old school day. We got a bit of sound system vibes there as well. You know, a little Carl and sound system thing. And again, you know, I'm not going to tell you all the techniques, but a lot of these photographs are the original photographs. So I really wanted to f have the people open the page up, look at the picture, and go to the time. Hmm. You know, some pictures of people that no one's ever heard of. It's not just about big names. It's about a big scene with big characters. Some people flops, they didn't last very long. You know, like and my you, TV you career, do, you, do you know what I mean? documented that period in such a... Like such someone a said to me, said, Norm, you were there, you can't go back. No. They could be the worst pictures in the world, it don't matter. It's the only visual record we've got. Yeah. Saw business the other day as well, he's going to be well happy. Half the people don't even know they're in the book, if they're in the book. I haven't told everyone who's in it, I've just done it. <laughs> this business when he's at New York, he's at the New York, was at the New Music Seminar and he's, he's, he's entered into the World DJ Supremacy Competition against the baddest DJs in the States and probably the world at the time. Wow. He's gone up there, UK bad boy, he's about the first DJ I ever see, he's pulled his t-shirt off mid-set. So he's doing that scratching, yeah, taking, yeah, 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 taking yeah, it off yeah. bit by bit. Yeah. And I've caught a shot of it when he's thrown the t-shirt off and it's flying wow. in the background. Moments like that, you know, Pivotal. Yeah, and it's like everyone like me would be too busy watching this amazing DJ, to, you know, exhibition, uh, to, you know, he's, he's, he's set because it's you're visual. You're looking to see it? what he's doing. Yeah, and you're listening, thinking bad boy, and then you're looking, thinking, hang on a second, and then you're like, hang on, did he just take his T-shirt off? <laughs> oh, heavy, you know. So I'm really hopeful that a lot of people go back to that time. Listen, mate, you should be proud of that book. I'm very proud of it. Who, who done, look, because I'm, I'm in the detail as well, who done the Norsky, um the lettering? Cause that right, lettering so this is the other person that i got to give a lot of credit to. Mm. Uh, and I'm going to read her name uh, properly because I've tried this before. Wicked font. Uh, Mariona Villaros. Wicked font. And she's based in Miami. Right. And she did the design. Mm. It's design and in design, we had many Zoom meetings, we had a lot of conversations. I entrusted her with a massive amount of my work. She came up with, we had a long talk about stuff and left her to do what she does well. A little bit like when you go into a producer's, you know, studio and you do your work and then you're like, all right, leave it with me and you go. And then you come back and you're like, oh my days, what have you done? He goes, yeah, well, I just put this there and you're like, what? That's what my designer did. She come up with she some maneuvers. And you know, and, I, and, I'm here, and she got my feel across. She's done the main yeah. like, stuff like this. See that? This thing here. Beautiful. She had a, a clip art that she had put there behind for the beginning of some of these chapters. Um, and I I got where it's come from. I hated it because I was like, everything in there that's visual, I, I have to have created it. So she's like, well, you need to give me something. And I said, well, you've got loads of bits. Just do what you do as a designer. 
But she's like, no, you can be specific. I want you to be what you want. So I was like, okay, so I cut took pictures of these bits of my own niece and saw them and I'm sending them out. She put them in the book. Do you know what I mean? But then she also come up with the font. There's about four different fonts being used within it. But what I loved about it was is I didn't want to make a hip hop magazine in hardback with all this wild she, style she, she, writing she, she, yeah. and all this street style. What I was doing was make a high class, top end coffee table book paying the highest respect on a, a print and publishing level to my culture so the paper is premium paper so that you can, look, you can turn you can it for years that, that is, that's it's proper. thick it's got a rubbery plastic sheen it feels like but it's deep blacks properly printed you know i mean it's a photography book remember so people are going to spend years mm. they're going to be spending years it's quality look at that with the fish eye yeah that's that shot i was talking about before with the fish, with the fish eye but you know but we did things like i said spot single See, you know, everyone would put loads. I was like, how are we going to do the book? Because you can't, it, it's a book. It's always going to be a book. How are you going to do this? I was like, you know what? It's going to feel like a bit of everyone's book because it's hard not to when it comes to photography. It's all arranged to put your contact sheets down now. Things all right. So I did a minimal amount of that and tried to try and just give full page bleed shots. You know what I mean? Uh, this is my favorite shot. One, my first ever hip hop shot. I'm going to show it to you now. I really want you to buy this book, guys. I'm selling it Listen, to you. Is anyone now. watching this? You've got to get this book. Uh, Norm Ski, Man with the Golden Shutter. That's the first real hip hop shot I took. 1985, Covent Garden. Yeah, wow. it looks like a war zone. It, you can that. see the the, the, war, the Covent Garden was nearly broken down and shut down. I've never seen that shot. No one's seen it. Wow. So that's what you're Norm, getting. I never realised. No, uh, that's what you're getting. When was that like? 85? That's 85, but around that, yeah, about 85. But that it looks older. In that time, because well, we're still in the 60s. It's 83, actually. I was going to say we're yeah, still in the 60s. The, 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 everything's a bombed out. That was a bomb, bombed out place. Wow. Let me tell you about this country. Yeah, don't be fooled. They ain't they really spent much money on it, you know. They ain't got other people to spend money on it. That's why they don't look English anymore. You got man's coming in with this the Dubai architecture. Have you been out to Tottenham Court Road? Yeah, Stop yeah. Stop yeah. it! What's happened to all the electrical shops? Well, they're all just changing into glass. Mm. You know, I used to have this wonderful Art Deco buildings like going all about that. Apparently that's really old world now. That's the character. I used to love all of that. Having everything just look like it's all come from Ikea. I mean, the fact that there's an Ikea on Oxford Street, really... That means all the IKEA stuff is going to be really cool now. It's, it's. I do, I being, do, I do miss eighties London, man. Ah, uh, you know, come on, you know, like Soho you with the red light districts. And well, they probably still got that there, but it's the the fact that there's an awful lot of new concrete, mm. and it's much bigger and much. It's all polished. It's, it's all very polished, polished very clean, and it kind of, it, it, there's no caricature to it, but it's very modern, mm. which to me is, you know, circuit board. Which, you know, and that's one of the things I love about this, is it's it not, captures, it it's captures not digital, that time. It it, it's, it's, time. it's, you know, come on, bruv. She, -rockers. she -rockers with Professor yeah. Griff, Griff yeah. when he did that little track of them, but they're at Sapper's Bush, where they used to go, the McDonald's, and yeah, practice yeah, every yeah, Saturday yeah, yeah. and rap and hang out. So I went to their ends, you know, I mean, it's I very, interviewed Donna from She Rockers. Well, Donna wrote a beautiful little thing for me as well that's in there. She wrote a nice about you know what it was like and what i was like you know i've got a few testimonials and that's what i wanted to do i really wanted to create something that was a voice yeah for the people you know i wrote a little bit i brother i've got see how fat that is i've got a lot of thick paper that's thicker than this encyclopedia it's ridiculous oh yeah i'm gonna show you one other thing listen you're wearing my cup down with that in the back i'm gonna show you well, here's a door stopper bruv you could use this when you've got to change your wheel yeah <laughs> stop up the car and jack up the car with it look at that for quality wow have a look at that look at that wow see the black in the detail it's see, all the, see in the it detail. yeah that's that's what I wanted. I wanted a black on black book. That's bulletproof. Yeah. Well, as you say, going, golden back, going back to the well made, you know, the well made high quality. quality. That's what I wanted, you know, and, and I think they did an incredible job. An bro, amazing job. It's taken me about two weeks to try to get like I am now because I was struggling. I was like, every time I picked up, I was like, oh my God, that's too good. I can't believe it. What have they done here? And they quit. What have they done? But no, how did they come up with, how did you come up with the, man, the, the name, the man with the golden shirt? Well, that was easy. wicked name. That was easy for me, really, because I was already called the man with the golden shutter as my section in Hip Hop Connection magazine. Oh. I used to have a little paparazzi section, yeah, which was where right. I'd go out and about, and mm. a man out and about. And so I think Andy might have made that up, or Chris, maybe Chris Hunt, the original. I think Chris Hunt, the original um, the editor and, and, and writer for Hip Hop Connection, 
uh, had an idea because they're all you know everyone was really always using their minds in the back in the day like that and he was like yeah we could have a oh you could be like the sort of you know james bond man with a golden gun like go yeah yeah because yeah, you're everywhere like a spy yeah, 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 shooting everyone up and basically this is this book has had a completely different title when i went to have this book done and my concept idea and i sat down with the editor and, and, and james publisher for our first proper meeting all together to discuss all the stuff i had together for then editor to have a look at it and go yeah i reckon we can make a book out of all of that which i knew all the time and we sat there and i picked up this one piece of the magazine which was that man with the golden shutter i took it out because it rang with me and i looked at that and i thought oh, i could put that in the book i could put that in the book actually have that as a page and i and in the meeting we're chatting away about the title my title was quite complicated quite deep very simple one word but an absolutely brilliant idea but it wasn't something that was going to be catchy when i said oh yeah that was another thing goes, what's that i goes oh that's my old name for the magazine the the, uh, the feet tracer having hip-hop connection magazine it's been normski man with the golden shutter and both of them went oh and james went oh i like that and i went and he said it and i stood back and i went he goes you know what that would be a really good title i goes you know what? i i think so as well you know i'd thought about that but i wasn't sure but you know what i get it now and that could have i could easily have had the whole logo with the gun that's a camera with the whole thing, I could have easily put out my thing, but I think, no, I'm not going to go too far, but I going to go for it because I do feel like the 001 of UK hip hop photography. Listen, Norm, you are the man with the golden shutter. And listen, it's been an absolute you honor. You can buy it can everywhere. Buy it. Can everywhere. Buy the book. Bruh, listen, you've got no, I, you got one for me. I'm not an independent bookseller. I'm not an independent. That's what I'm saying. I'm not an independent bookseller. <laughs> yeah, this is a book that's been put out by a publisher. And my work is done. I need to come but, to one of you personally. You will do, and I sign and everything. But what I'm saying though is, is that this book is on general release worldwide. It's currently between two and three of Amazon top bestsellers. And <clears throat> you can get it on every single good website that sells books. Waterstones, Devil Wake Smiths. I mean, it really is every time i have a look to see where it's on sale i go into google normski mammoth golden shutter and there's another two or three bookshops it's a hot one so everyone's going oh we'll get that in stock i need yeah. to get one of you it's that time of the year as well christmas coming up about yeah, yeah, a thousand yeah, yeah. books came out in the last get four this weeks book. anyone watching get the book seriously get yeah. the book no no it's a depo you don't have to rush into it but do sort it out you because... know prit prit prit's got a copy of it and he's telling me how amazing your book is and yeah like, that's you know but i spoke to prit about something else and then he found out about the book and he got one and that's why we're talking so big up prit yeah, yeah big up prit big time he did say that you know he mentioned you know i went oh yeah get him to get in touch we talked about doing this is the right time we to spoke do about it doing it years ago yeah but but this is better this is the time man this, this is, is better time. yeah you know sometimes you've got to let the tree grow and let the fruit yeah. flipping ripe and a couple yeah. of you before you start eating it you know what i mean and you know like i say it creates a lot it takes a lifetime to create a history to actually have anything interesting to talk about so it's nice to stand there now and look back at the last 30 odd years and sort of see what i've done but nice right now this was before television this is all before anything did work in this book yeah, and the only reason why I ever got a name out there as a household name is because I was out there taking photographs. That was that's my, my meal ticket, that's my vehicle. And now I've kind of got a book of it all together. I might actually go and learn the knowledge and start doing cabin. Do you know what I was gonna I was gonna say, Norm, I was gonna say if it wasn't if it wasn't for you uh, being a wicked photographer, uh, uh, you would make a brilliant cab driver, do you know? Uh, you know I, I've heard that before. My family are all transport. They've all done that. Private. You would make a brilliant chauffeur to cabin. royalty and all this stuff. You'd um, make a yeah. But li but listen, I hope you enjoyed this interview. I loved oh. it. I loved it. I mean, to be honest, listen, you burned out three of my batteries. Oh, hey, bro. Three of my I got, batteries. I got to open a window, mate. <laughs> we got to open a window. Listen, the ultra cab. We've got to open the win. I'll check out big love to you every day, man. Thank you so much for having me. Normski, really listen, big it. love, man. And it's been a long time coming. And anyone yeah. watching, you know, subscribe to this channel. I've, been, I've interviewed Public Enemy, uh, Sydney Don. Ultramagnetic, Don. Uh, Man Parish, Cosmo D Nucleus, wow. so Rodney P, Skinny wow. Man. He's in it. But listen, wow. more, in, <laughs> more important, go out and get it, get this book for Christmas because this is a serious stocking for that. Absolutely. In fact, it ain't going to feel a stocking. No. This is going to be under the no, tree in the big bush. <laughs> <laughs> this is the one that Look you at use. the size of it. Look, do you want to hear something? Yes. Yeah. 
Whoa! <laughs> heavyweight! Yeah. And now I'm with a lightweight business, a heavyweight Please. weapon! Listen. A weapon of hip hop destruction! Destruction! Listen, Normski, an absolute honour. It's been great, mate. Can we get out now? Peace! Thank yeah, you very yeah. much. Bye! I'll unlock the doors. I'll unlock the doors. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, oh, that is cool, man. He was oh, I fucking loved it. He was Actually, I might as well stay in there. You can drive me back yeah, around the corner. Oh, what a laugh.